Yo, we got hip hop history in the building. Bed Stars own definitely a part of the golden era of hip hop. Please welcome Lil C's the Vlad TV. C's what up? What's good? What's good, baby? What's up with you? I'm good. I'm good. Good to see you, brother. Long likewise, time. Likewise, likewise, dog. You know, we go way back, baby. True indeed. True indeed. Yo, What's C's, up? let's take this thing back. You got so much history. You've been part of so much hip hop history. Um, and I just want to cover as much of it as we can. You born and raised in Brooklyn, Brooklyn zone, Bed Stuy, Brooklyn. What was no it doubt. like growing up in the eighties and nineties? Uh, it was real. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, it was a lot of poverty, a lot of struggle. There's a lot of crime going on in the neighborhood I was living in, which is totally different now. But you know, uh, you know, things change for the better. It's very, uh, it's, it's very gentrified now and diverse with all all races of people. But back then. It was the it was the neighborhood, you know what I mean? And it was just a lot of stuff just going on. Everybody was just trying to make a make a living and trying to survive, you know what I mean? And uh, you know, rap is the thing that kind of got us off the streets. True indeed. Like you are synonymous. Your best friend is arguably one of the greatest, if not the greatest, individual to ever touch a microphone in hip hop. How did you meet Biggie? And and I heard a rumor that um y'all might be related. Are y'all related at all? Nah, nah. Um, everybody be thinking we related because a few, of course, uh, some documentaries and probably a few interviews where you know people spoke on it. But nah, I'm not. Uh, you know, Big is full blown. He's full time Jamaican, hundred percent. I'm not Jamaican, but we were just very close. I knew Big since I was about seven years old. I was actually graduating from public uh public school, and I got hit by a car like two days before that. And um, I was walking to my prom with crutches, and he gave me like five or six dollars on my way to school, like to get you know, get me some candy, get me some lunch, and let me celebrate. And um, that was like our first like real connection of me, um, you know, remembering him. What was Big like when he was young? Cool man, cool. He, I mean, you know, he was about his business, he was about his hustle, but he he showed love though. You know, what I mean, he was all about his neighborhood and his peoples. You know, what I mean, you know, you see every interview. Before he passed, all he's talked about was his family and his homeboys. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's all he really cared about was making sure he was good, his family was good, and his people was good. So he was just a dude that just, like, spread that love, you know, always looking out for other people. And he was always about his business, you know what I'm saying? Like a stand-up dude. That's dope. That's dope. Um, you know, I know Big started hustling at an early age. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, did you see Big go from just being a dude around the block to starting to hustle? Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, kind of like everybody in the neighborhood was kind of doing that. That because there was like it was no other choice. Either you was rapping, or you was playing basketball, or you was in the streets. You know what I'm saying? And uh, of course, a lot of the youngsters that really didn't have, you know, that really had no direction, we all went to the streets. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's it, it was a hangout thing at first, just hanging out on the block and just chilling. And eventually, you might run into somebody or meet somebody that's putting you on to something, and it kind of just like went from there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like like when y'all was coming up and Big is doing his thing in the street, y'all doing whatever y'all doing, how how much was the music? How much was the culture? Was Big rhyming back then? Was he just somebody standing on a corner that you could look at and be like, I know he out here. You know, you ain't even thinking record deal at that time, but but he is really spitting. At what yeah. what age did he start spitting? I mean, well, he was rapping actually before we all knew he was rapping. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, he was doing like, he used to do videos like he was on Video Music Box, you know, like going to certain staircases and certain locations that he would rap. And this was him like probably like 14. So this is before mm -hmm. I even knew he rapped. I didn't know he rapped till like he was about like 18, 19. You know what I mean? The way one day he spit a rhyme at a club one time. And I was like, oh shit, my nigga, this nigga nice. Like, you know what I'm saying? And that's when it came, but he was already rapping before that. You know what I mean? But he just wouldn't rap to people. You know what I mean? But music was in our life heavily. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, just sitting around the way when you wanted to get off the block or you just sitting home and all your homeboys in the crib smoking weed. We're listening to N.W.A., Niggas for Life. We're listening to Mama Said Knock You Out. It's certain albums from them times I can remember. Uh, you know, um, America's Most Wanted. You know what I mean? Like, it was a lot of like, you know, of course, the chronic. That's when the West Coast, it was a lot of that music. But we was always musically inclined with things because that was like our savior to get away from the streets. You know what I'm saying? At that time, do you think that he was just rhyming just as a hobby or did he always have dreams of making it big time? I mean, from talking to, you know, his homeboys that he went to uh, Catholic school with, you know, back in them mm -hmm. times, he was he was serious about it. 
You know what I'm saying? Like he was, you know, they used to sit in the house after school and he's working on melodies and, and, and raps and metaphors and like, no, he was serious with it from, from day one. But I don't think he was serious as in getting the deal in the beginning. You know what I mean? Like, and I think after like the 13 to 14 range, he kind of like, well, all right, ain't nothing gonna happen with this. And that's when he got more attached to the streets. And then it came right back to him. And that's when all the other stuff started to happen. You know, him freestyling in clubs and people started to come to the neighborhood. Jazzo, you know, that should be with Jay-Z used to come look for him. Buster, you know what I'm saying? Like everybody was starting to come check for this guy that was on St. James, this, this big, this big fat dude that's on St. James in Fulton Street. I heard he's nasty with it. Mm. And that's kind of like how the buzz started to happen from there. Oh, that's dope, man. That's yeah. dope. I know he, he, he was heavy in the streets. He was doing his thing. He gets arrested down in North Carolina yeah. at some point for selling crack. Mm -hmm. um, spent nine months in jail. Mm -hmm. When he came out, he um he made that demo tape yeah. that you know we all have heard is is legendary at this point. But this is the first time he ever called himself Biggie Smalls. Where yeah. did that name come from? Um, I forgot who gave him that name, but you know it's at one point we just woke up. We used to always call him Big anyway. You know what I mean? It was Chris first, then we just call him Big, and then he kind of just ran with the Biggie Smalls. You know what I'm saying? And everybody just kind of just gravitated to it. You know what I'm saying? Like, we didn't, we never asked where it came from. No, nothing. We just like started to call him that. Like, ah, oh, you're Biggie, big. You know what I mean? He already had them AKs once he started, you know, once the word got around that he'd get busy with the pen. You know what I mean? It was already something there. But obviously, the, uh, the, the, the kid that rapped, the white boy, he had that name. Mm -hmm. So when mm -hmm. th things started to get serious with Big, you know what I mean? Like far as record deal wise and signing contracts, he couldn't use that name because somebody else already had that name. And that's yep. how he transferred the name to Notorious B.I.G. When did you start rapping? Uh, I, when I really started rapping, I started rapping yeah. after Biggie passed, when I had to write my album. You know, because in, in them times before that, Biggie was writing the raps for me. You know what I'm Got saying? You. Everybody else was writing their rhymes though. You know, Klepto, Lil' Kim, Trife, Banger. The main people was the main friends he had was like me, Nino, Chico, Capone, and Bugsy. Nino, Capone, and Bugsy is all related. We didn't rap. Chico rapped, though. You know what I mean? He, uh -huh. he used to live a, a building away from Big. He rapped. So most of the artists from Junior Mafia rap. I just wasn't a rapper. It was just an idea he had just for me performing with him that whole year before we got our record deal. You know, he got his record deal. His album came out in 94. We came out of '95, Junior Mafia. Mm -hmm. So it was just like a, it, it was a, it was like a business move for him. Something he wanted to try out. You know what I mean? He used to see me rocking with him. He was like, "You, you got it, you got it. You just don't rap." He used to try to get me to rap. I was just intimidated because I'm like, "This nigga's so nice. He's so dope. <laughs> I can't write nothing nowhere near close to what the fuck this nigga doing." You know what I'm saying? But he used to always tell me, "Don't worry about what you say. It's how you say it." You know what I mean? And I just, I was, I was always just scared to write songs around him. And then he was just like, yo, I'm going to write you a bunch of raps and you're going to deliver them. You think you could do it? And I was like, I'm with it. And that's kind of like how I got into it. He was just like, yo, I'm just going to jot you something down. He knew I was good with memorizing songs and things like that because I had to memorize everything he did because I was performing with him all the time. So that's kind of like how my birth came into, uh, to, uh, you know, getting into the music thing. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Where'd you get the name Lil C's from? Did he um, give you that name? I got it from a mafia book. Because when he first, when we realized all the time he was shouting us out on these songs, we never knew who Junior Mafia was. Like, first couple of freestyles, we like, yo, who that? He was like, that's y'all, nigga. Oh, get shit, out of word. here. Yeah, dog. <laughs> he was already having this plan in his head. So once we figured that out, he was like, yo, you know, this is the plan I got. This is what I'm going to do. Y'all all come up with some names. So we always to watch, you know, Casino, you know, Goodfellas, all these mafia movies. And we used to read these books and I just saw a name and it said Lil Caesar. He was like five, four, five, three. He wasn't aggressive. He was the one that's like throwing all the parties. He's the one that got all the women and shit like that. And I was like, all right, that sounds like more of my range. And I was mm -hmm. like, yo, I'm Lil Caesar. And he was, he looked <laughs> and he just shook his head and that was it. And he just, he was calling me that. He was calling me that since then. And that's, yeah, that's just kind of like how the name got birth. You know what I'm saying? Yo, so what was it about you? And, because everybody, when they think of uh, Big, they think of Lil C's. When they think of Lil C's, they think of Big. Like, 
y'all two really had a special bond, but mm -hmm. he had a lot of people around him. You just mentioned some of the people who was in the Junior Mafia clique. Like, what was it about y'all two that really just connected and you becoming his best friend like that? Uh, you know, every time I get asked that, I'd be, you know, I'd be stuck. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm a little older now, so I kind of got an understanding to it. I just think he knew I was, you know, he knew I was down for him. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it was a lot of people that was down for him. Don't get it twisted, mm -hmm. but it was just, it was very seeable with me. It was very visible and you could feel it. Like I was just, outside of being the homeboy, I was his biggest fan too. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I used to be amazed by what he was doing. You know what I mean? Outside of knowing him for all them years, I used to still sit back and be like, can't believe you saying that shit, dog. Like, yo, my nigga, you, yo, you, nigga, you that nigga, dog. You know what I'm saying? Like, and he, he just knew, like, all right, this little motherfucker down for me. He knew where my heart was. And out of all the little young guys, I was the one that probably was reachable talking wise. Like, you know, some of the, you know, some of my homeboys back then, like the Nino and them, you couldn't reach. These little, they was already active and moving. And I was just kind of just following suit, just chasing them. And B, B, I knew, like, that ain't you, dog. That ain't you. Like, nah. You know, when I used to try to hustle, he'd be like, nah, you, uh, he used to lie to me. He wouldn't say no. He'd be like, nah, nah, I got you next week. Nah, I'm going to let you come out of town with me when I come back. And there's always to be something. I'd be like, yo, I can come with you? Nah, nah, the truck filled up, but I got you when I come back. I got you when I come back. He always was pushing me away from that. But as soon as the rap thing happened, and then as soon as the music even started, the first show he did in North Carolina at Kamikaze's or something, we was in Raleigh. I drove down there with him. I was 13. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. ever since the music started, he kept me away from that. He was like, yo, I got something else special for you. And, and from there on, I didn't leave his side. He had me with him. He was like, yo, this little, he went talk to my mom. I was like, this little motherfucker don't go to school. He dropped his knapsack off under the staircase. He come to my <laughs> house. So let me just take him with me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want to save him. He going to either go to jail out here or he going to be dead or he going to be stuck on this corner. You know what I'm saying? So he talked to my moms. My moms asked me what I wanted to do. You want to stay in school? Or you want to go with him? She was like, either way, you're going to still be my son. You know what I mean? I'd rather you go to school, get the education. But if that don't work and you want to be 40 years old living in the back of your mom's house in your back room still, that'll be forever your room. But if, make sure that take care of everything that you're supposed to do. And she let me make that choice at like 14 years old. And I went on the road with him and never looked back. Yo, you know, even listening to you speak. Big was more like a big brother to you. No doubt. And, and that was so much real love because you telling me he was pushing you away from the streets. Even when you was like, yo, let me come. Yeah. Nah, this ain't for you. Like, I got you next week. That That's a genuine love. You know, yeah. he didn't look at you like, okay, I can make money off him. I can make money with him. Nah, I want to keep him off the streets. I see something bigger and better in this yeah. man. That's dope. And he saw that in all of us. You know what I'm saying? Like, even the ones that was heading towards the wrong direction. You know what I'm saying? He was like, nah, I don't want y'all doing this. That was his whole purpose of putting the group together. How many people you know back in them days was actually grabbing little young dudes off the street and writing songs for them? Or if he know you can rap, he's getting you a studio. He's got people going up every day, getting on the train back and forth, going to these meetings, trying to get you a deal. He genuinely cared about his surroundings. And he didn't want us to grow up like... He was growing up, you know what I'm saying? Like we were seeing what was going on out there. It was, it was treacherous waters. Like, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't this, you know, the way we work today, you got things to distract you, computers and phones. And imagine in the nineties when we ain't have none of that. You out, you outside all day. You can't be on the phone because your mom's hogging the phone in the crib. There's one phone in the house that drags a long ass wire through there. <laughs> your sister got the phone next. And you know, your mom's, going, your, your brother on the phone next. It's like your only time was to go outside. And then when you're outside, anything can be. You know what I mean? You're walking outside, you're still on the corner, you sit next to somebody that got drama with somebody, somebody might come back here, try to stab him or shoot him. Next thing you could get involved in something. So it was very easy to get caught up out there. So you know what I mean? What he did was really big for us because he was really getting us away from that so early. And we was already, you know, active and getting into shit because we was, you know, we was young. You know, you doing teenager shit. You know what I'm saying? Yep. You know, you out there, you trying to rob, you know, you out there starting shit, you fighting in school, you know what I mean? You you come back home, you trying to hustle. You 14, 15 years old, dog, you know, getting chased and next thing you know, your mom's got to come pick you up from the precinct. You know what I mean? Like it was stuff like that. And he was just like, yo, I'm gonna try to avoid y'all from that because it's real out here. You know what I'm saying? So that's just kind of like, you know, that's just who he was. You know, so it wasn't just me. He did that for a lot of people, just that it was just a bond with me. I would just, you know, I didn't want to leave his side. You know what I'm saying? When mm -hmm. it was days going on, I want to stay with him. Whenever he was writing songs, I'm the one sitting in the room with him while he's writing them. You know, yo, we want that back for me. I want that back for you. Yo, roll up that. Roll up some weed for me. 
I roll up the weed. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I got you. Like, it was the support system. And I just think that he was peeping that. Like, all right, you know what? This little dude, he young. He too young to even have this type of energy, this type of love. If I put him around me, I'm going I'm to I'm mold him into what he needs to be. And I think that's what he was doing with me. Like, all right, I know I can work with this one. I could, I could change him. And if mm -hmm. I could change him, I might could change everybody else once they see what's happening to him. And that's kind of like what happened. Once everybody was seeing the love, all the all my little young homeboys that was out there doing shit, they started to gravitate to that. Like, all right, you know what? All right, we're gonna we're gonna fuck with Big. And he was fucking with everybody too. You know what I mean? Like, you're not. Nah, I ain't going nowhere without my crew. We all lived on the same block, grew up with each other since we were six, seven years old. You know what I mean? So that's how that's how real he was keeping it. It was all love with him. Yo, did you did you ever look at this man? You said you was there when he was writing rhymes and all that. Did you ever look at this man and understand he on a different level because he didn't even write? Like like Big would just sit there and come up with these crazy verses mm -hmm. in his head. Like how was y'all when when you first started to notice like he's different? I mean, like, in, the, like, in the beginning of Ready to Die, he was writing. In the beginning, you know, yeah, okay. yeah, in the beginning he was writing. You know that yellow. That yellow pad mm -hmm. or the uh composition book, you know, he no, it's it's raps. I'm sure his mom still have that that was left in the house. Like he was writing. He ain't started the no writing thing till like right before life after death. You know what I'm saying? Like he started to lock in it, you know, it was the exercise for doing it so much, you know what I mean? Like he started to lock in on memorizing things, but in the beginning, he was definitely writing. But just the stuff that he was writing, you know what I mean? It was just a you know, for a 14 year old was amazing to me. And then mm -hmm. being at the age I'm in now, you know, I'm 44 years old. I look back now, I'm like, damn, he was only 21, 20 years old, you know, writing everyday struggle, you know, writing me and my bitch, writing suicidal thoughts at 20. I'm like, yo, what you, you know, like, was you really thinking about that? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you know, you sitting back high, like, yo, dog, you really was thinking about killing yourself? Like, you know, but you know, he, he told you how his mind state was of that. It's like, nah, just everything you're doing, you know, you you risking your life every day. That was the whole title of Ready to Die. He was like, yo, it's not like I'm ready to die, but I'm doing all these things that I can get caught up and get killed. Or I can get caught up and die. So you're you're risking your life every day if you're going out there robbing, you're going out there hustling. You know what I mean? You, you're out there doing shit. Yeah, you're risking your life every day. So yeah, you're ready to die. You know what I'm saying? And I should just I should just be amazed by what he was writing. And I'm like, yo, we so close to this. But in them times, you didn't think he would make it. Cause back in them times, it wasn't like you just like, yo, we from St. James and Fulton. Dad crack a best star in the hood. Man, this shit ain't gonna happen. <laughs> he nice as fuck though, but this shit ain't gonna happen. That was just your, you know, that was just our energy. We didn't think nobody would make it from our neighborhood. It just seemed like it was just something that was just unheard of. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. of course it was shocking, but I always thought like, yo, no matter what happens, man, you one of the dopest motherfuckers I ever heard in my life. And I'm like, I always tell, I ain't saying that nigga because we, you know, because we brothers. I'm like, no, dog, you're, you're different. And I used to watch how people treated him, like other artists, like, no, nigga, you are amazing, bro. Like, you know, people used to come to our neighborhoods for him. That's when I knew, like, all right, all right, this shit really real. This shit could change. You know what I'm saying? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, speaking of people coming to your neighborhood, I know in 92, like, like 91, 92, Mr. C, he yeah. gets his hand on Biggie's demo tape, gets his over to the source. Which we know at that time the source was source was on it, fire. It, source was, source on fire. was on fire. They used to have oh. the source van run around with the big ass speakers, remember? Yep. And they yeah. used to come through through avenues bumping whoever album came out. Like, yeah, source was it. Yo, so when Biggie turns up in the unsigned hype section of the source, mm -hmm. did y'all start cause you was like, yo, you know, we young at the time. We don't know if this is really going to happen, but that that's a major step because Unsigned Hype, that was one of the uh, uh, premier articles in the source that everybody was looking at. Yeah. So was at, at that point when, when Big turned up in the source, was y'all like, yo, this could be real. Like, like, we could really, really take this thing. I mean, you know, we was excited, but we wasn't too excited. It was just like, you know, it was dope to see it, but we looking like, all right, it's a little page, all right, you know. Unsigned, uh -huh. you're not thinking nothing gonna come from that because, you know, we wasn't really seeing people get deals from that or see people blossom like how big did from an unsigned hype. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? It ain't get, but that got the attention of Puff. You know okay, what I'm that's where we going yeah, with Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. That got the attention of Puff, so it, it did work out. You know what I mean? So he come back like, yo, Puff want me to come to his office, you know. And we all knew from, at this time, you know, Puff wasn't Puff, but Puff was working with, you know, Jodeci, Hev, Mary. 
you know, yep. Andre. So we knew who he was. So it's like, word? Like, dead ass? You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> like, yeah. I didn't go with him to that meeting, but you know, D-Rock, you know what I'm saying? My brother D-Rock went with him. And um, that's when it was like, okay, this shit, you know, this shit is something. And he came back and he was all smiles. Like, nah, he ain't shoot me down. Nah, <laughs> he trying to sign me. We like, what? Nigga, he trying to sign you. That's when shit was like, all right, let's go get some, let's go get some beers. Let's go get some St. Nas. You know, this is St. Nas era and shit. You know what I'm saying? Let's go get some St. Nas. Let's go get a bunch of dime bags. And we're about to go on top of his roof, get high as shit, and manifest this shit. You know what I mean? That's kind of like just what we did. You know what I mean? Like, because we knew it was real at that point. Not to say it was going to happen, but just the fact that somebody like Puff Daddy reached out to him and wanted to actually meet him and see him and was like, yo, you nice. You actually, everything I heard on that demo, mm -hmm. yeah, it was, it was it was on and popping from there. Yo, then then Puff put him on the Mary J. Blige Real yeah, Love that's, remix. See, yeah, that's Action speak louder than words. He was like, all right, I ain't just sitting here telling you that. Here, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, look, I'm going I'm to let you know it's real. And that's how he was like, you know, he was schooling Big. Like, that's when Big was starting to learn how to how to rap. Yo, this is not. Just give me 12 bars of this. Big, like, what's bars? I'm going to show you how to count these bars. And mm -hmm. here, I just need 12 bars right here. Eight bars. And then he put them on a the, uh, Super Cat joint. Then he threw them on a, the, uh, what's that? What was, uh, he did a Heavy D record. I forgot what record it was, but he did a record with Hev. And then, of course, his relationship with Tupac, he had the uh, the joint with him and Pac and uh, Grand Pooba. There's a few mm -hmm. other people on that. Um, and that's when he was just getting his, you know, just the features. You know what I'm saying? And outside of that, you know, he doing shit with Onyx, the Who's Party and Bullshit. They threw on the Who's the Man soundtrack. Yep. Like, yep. you know, he was really investing in Big at that time because he knew he knew what that, he knew what we knew. This nigga yeah. is special, dog. And just to get that love from him, we knew, like, okay, if Puff fucking with him, oh, this shit is real. You know what I'm saying? Like, Come on, what better person to have at that time, you know, schooling you and, and really pushing you there? Puff was like one of the hottest like executives at that time, you know what I'm saying? So just for him to grab big and he felt like he found something. He was like, yo, I got something different right here. And he invested, he invested that shit into it and look what came from it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, what well, like you said, it was no longer just talk because Puff was he was showing and proving. He was putting them on all these different records, all these different remixes. But what people don't realize about Puff, Puff is is damn near Big's age. He's about a year, maybe two older at max. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, just about like three years, like two or three years. I say, yeah, yeah. huh? So as Big is starting to get these features and Puff's putting them on these different records. How real did it get for Big at that point? Did he start to say to himself, I'm going all in with this rap thing? Or did he have one foot in the streets and one foot in the music industry? It wasn't even one foot in the streets. Of course, we were still uh, uh, attached to the streets, you know what I'm saying? Because nothing, was, nothing wasn't nothing was solidified money-wise and contract-wise. So we were still dipping in the streets. But the music was definitely serious. I mean, you know. Nah, we in the studio every day now. You know, he's working now. You ain't got time to be in the streets no more now. You know, I got to go do this Dolly Cat, uh, this, you know, this Super Cat verse. Then a week later, you shooting that video. You know what I'm saying? Then, yo, I got to mm -hmm. go to Hev Studio, go do this with Hev. Y'all got to go in and do this song with Onyx and uh, Naughty by Nature. Like, it was like constant work because I think Puff was trying to keep him off the streets. Now, let me keep you busy. Let me keep you busy because it was easy to go right back there because that's where we was going back to once we leave the studio, once we leave the street. We... Coming from the studio three in the morning, we right back on the block, four o'clock in the morning, listening to that shit. After we yo, let me get a copy of that. Yo, go yeah. get the radio, get some batteries. We're gonna blast that shit now to the niggas that didn't come to the lab. Yo, what you think about this show? That shit fire. Shit crazy. You know, niggas would be stealing tapes and all type of shit. Like, so we were still there because that was still home. But nah, in the streets and dealing in the streets, nah, he was kind of slowing up on that because he seen what was actually happening. You know what I mean? Like, you wouldn't want to hustle if you go in the studio, you sitting in there with Onyx, and the next day, you in the studio with have. Next day, you in there with Sadat. You know what I mean? Next day, you in there mm -hmm. with Meth. You know what I mean? Like, shit is happening like this, too. It, 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 was, it was fast. It was fast. It was, it was fast. fast. It was fast. It was going in there. That's what he loved. You know, outside of the, 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 the shit, he loved the music. And you can hear it in him. He was a he was big on music, dog. He ain't want to just be hardcore. He wanted to be metaphoric. He wanted to be slick Rick storytelling. He wanted to be flows like Kane. He was a, he was a real artist. He was a real rapper like you know what i'm saying like he, so it, it takes time to master that so a lot of times we listen to music you know what i'm saying we go on the beat street yo who album came out today let's go grab this shit we're going to get battery we're going to listen to that shit while we sit on the block so it became less 
hustling, and it became more music, especially when things started to happen. So it wasn't even about one foot. Both foots was in, in music, in the, you know what I mean? But, you know, of course, you know, just to survive, he was still dabbing in, you know, in between, but it wasn't really, you know, him. He was just like, you know, somebody else would do that. He was just like, yo, nah, I'm focused on this. And everybody was pushing him to do that too. Yo, nah, dog, fuck the streets, my nigga. You got a shot to really change your life right now. You know what I mean? Like the real OGs that was out there that really knew he had talent, they was trying to push him away from the streets. Like, nah, dog, you nice, man. Come on, man. Put the city on the map type of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. I know around that time, he had his own daughter at that point. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah. Did, yeah, did that make him more focused on the music? Like, yo, I, I I gotta blow. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That was like, you know, that was like one of the pivotal points where he was like, all right, I gotta take this shit serious. I mean, cause mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's when he started to realize if I sit out here and I get caught up, I won't be here to take care of my daughter. And his mom's was on him too, you know what I mean? Knowing he was hustling, his mom was Jehovah Witness, you know what I mean? Mima, we called yeah. him Miss Wallace. She was totally against all that, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, he knew he was doing something to disappoint her, so he was really trying to get out of that. You know what I mean? It was for his daughter. It was for his moms. And he wanted to get his homeboys off the street too. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the home, you know, his, his niggas was major with everything. You know what I mean? That's why he did what he did for us. Like, that was really major for him. Like, he, that's just who he was too. That was just in his nature. That was in his heart. Like, yo, if I'm on, if I got money, you gonna have money. Yeah, I'm gonna bust you down till you get your own though. You know what I mean? Like, here, I'm gonna help you out. Got you. You know what I mean? If I got $500, I'm giving you 200 here, you take the other buck, I'ma tuck in 200. But it's only gonna be, it's only gonna be temporarily. Before you know it, he like, now you got your own 500. Now you bust down your two homeboys. You got your 500, you bust down your two homeboys. That was his mind state. The dude was, man, the dude was sharp as a mosquito's needle, man. Yeah, nah, that's dope, man. Um, Around the same time, you know, another legendary figure comes into his life, Tupac. Yeah. Uh. Was you there when he met Tupac for the first time? No, nah, I wasn't there when he met him the first time. I think that was out of town or something, too. I think he met him. I think it was at some event. I think he went with Puff or something. He was out of town, I think, when he met him the first time. How close How close did they really get in real life? Man, it was close, though. Close. It was, yeah? it, it was a music thing. You know what I mean? Like, Pac knew. You know, Pac was a dope dude. You know what I'm saying? Like, he was the one out there really, like, you know, pushing the culture. You know, music and acting. He heard party and bullshit and reached out to Big. Like, yo, mm. who is this dude rapping on this shit right here? And that's how him and Big, that's how they, that's how they got together. He loved party and bullshit. That was like, he was like, yo, this record right here, who the fuck saying this? Yo, find him for me. And you know what I mean? And that's how him and Big first got together and kicked it. And you know, and he he was just like, you know, schooling Big to a lot of shit, you know, just the music. You know, like, you know, he the one that was telling Big, like, yo, you know, don't make everything all hardcore. Like, you know, do some of the records for the women. You know, do some records for the radio. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, you, mm -hmm. you heard Big say that before in interviews. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, tell him, like, yo, nah, he was really just schooling him. You know what I'm saying? And every time Pac would come to New York, we'd get up with him. Anytime he had a show, Big coming out. You know what I mean? He brought Big out to Javaga Square one time. You know, the big spot that was in Queens back in the days. You know what I'm saying? We performed at the Ritz with him one time. Like they, they really bonded, and it was like a a music thing. And Easy Mo B played the part in that too, because Easy Mo B was a producer. He was producing for Tupac and producing for Big. You know what I mean? So it was just there. They was just tight from the rip. Both Gemini's, both was going through that same struggle. So yeah, they was really like dope friends. He used to come hang out. That nigga came on Fulton Street a few times, hung out with us. You know what I mean? Kicked it. You know that's why we were stuck on him. Like yo, this is a real motherfucker. You know, because back in them times, Fulton Street was. And just to see somebody of his stature on Fulton Street, like, oh, you're a real motherfucker, dog. So he would literally come to Fulton Street and hang out. Yeah. I remember the first time, I think that was the first time I met him. He came on mm. Fulton Street one time to pick up Big. Mm -hmm. And I just started hustling for Nino, for my group. Yep. Because I told you, Big wouldn't let me hustle. I think I hustled about a week, two weeks. It ain't last. <laughs> and, uh... That day I had my shit on me. I didn't want them to leave me. So I didn't want to go home and put the stuff in the crib. So I just kept it with me. Cause I was like, yo, I'm going. You know what I'm saying? And we went and uh he brought Big out to one of his shows. And I remember when I came back home, I was I was drunk, I was high, and I was walking through my crib and, and all of the jacks of the crap was like trailing through my house. Mm -hmm. And I went and just laid straight down on my bed. And I remember my mom was waking me up, like, like trying to take off my clothes. You know, back in the day when you sleep in your clothes, yeah. your mom would take off your sneakers. And, and I was just like, yo, ma, what's wrong with you? Why are you doing that? So when I woke up the next morning, my sister was like, 
you know, my sister used to be in the streets, my oldest sister, you know, she 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 went through a lot of shit. And um, she came and she pulled me in the room and she was like, so you hustling? I was like, nah. She was like, don't lie. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, yeah, a little bit. And she was like, yeah, I know, because, you know, you came in here drunk and left a trail of fucking crap coming <laughs> through here. And, you know, that's why you said that's why moms was trying to take off your clothes and all that, because she was searching through your pockets and stuff. And that's when she was just like, yo, you know, if you're going to do that type of shit, you should let your family know. Let me know. I'll tell you how to do it. Or let somebody school you to doing shit. You see how you slipping? And that was kind of like, I think that was, it, it was over for me after that. I was just like, all right, this, this shit ain't me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm totally not with it. But that was the first time I met him from that point. And I knew it was real then. He was coming on the block, like coming in, sitting there, literally hanging out with us. Not just coming to get big. He would sit out there, roll up a blunt, sit out there, talk shit to all the little youngins out there. You know what I mean? Like telling us to stay right. Yo, keep your head up and, you know, thug life. And you know what I mean? Like really just being who he was. And that was the real shit. They really had a real bond. They was like really, really friends in real life outside the music. Hmm. Yo, is it true at one point, um, I don't know if it was Big or somebody in the crew, but some guns got left behind in a hotel room. And then Pac get, I don't know if he got busted by the police on the, on the sexual assault thing, but needless to say, the guns, you know, they they charged with him. The charges were eventually dropped, but he uh -huh. ain't never snitched, never say nothing about this came from Big or from Big's crew. Is that real? I wasn't there for that. So I, I wasn't there for that, but I, nah, I never even heard that. Nah, big in them ain't, and it was just big and probably one of his other homeboys there. And nah, they ain't leave nothing there. From what I okay. know, you know what I'm saying? Got you. Yeah. Okay, so right around this time, 1994, mm -hmm. this is Ready to Die, the album. Talk to me about the process. Like, what was it like during the making of that album? Shit was fun, dog. Shit was fun yeah? as fuck, man. I mean, we was out the streets. This one, it was real. Contract signed. Deal on the table. We got we got some advance money. You know what I'm saying? It's more liquor now. We done, we done made the transformation from beer to liquor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it went from, uh, you know, just regular green weed to Branson. You know, things started to change. And it was just fun being off the streets. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, we ain't on the block no more. You know what I'm saying? You're in the studio every day. Home, everybody. We 20 deep in the studio. You know what I mean? C Gutter, D-Rock, everybody's in the studio. So it was like, you go on the block now, the block is clear. Like, yo, where everybody at? Oh, they probably in the studio with Big, you know what I'm saying? And uh, he didn't mind sitting there working around people. I think that's what more amped him up. He used to get a lot of ideas from us sitting around cracking jokes and talking shit, you know what I mean? A lot of this shit that we used to talk, we were hearing the rap. Like, oh shit, he put that shit in the song? That nigga <laughs> was absorbing like a motherfucker. He'd sit in the room and you'd think he not listening. He's hearing everything. And next thing you know, you would hear that shit and you would hear that shit in the bar or hear that shit in the hook, you know what I'm saying? But it was fun. It was just us off the streets and watching him create, man. It was like, you know, you was watching magic happen. That was us just, you know, being in the studio. Then Puffer coming in, spice some shit up, you know what I mean? And make this shit sound crazy. And us being kids, you know, we 15, like 14, like, oh shit, mother. We sitting around Puff Daddy every day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, to us, these are big time, you know, Tupac and Puff and them. Back in them time, these are big time fucking stars to a teenager. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, and we big wasn't a star to us at the time. That's still just that's bi, you know, that's bi to us. But we knew something was happening because just the surroundings and the atmosphere. You know, we wasn't in no little ass studio. You know, we're in this big ass hip factory. We're in Chung King. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, this shit is really legit. You got big ass boards. I'm like, oh, this is, this is real. It's like the funny shit. You'll get mad if you got left to go to the studio. You like, fuck it, I'm an iron horse. I'm gonna jump on the train. Yo, where y'all at? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that's how we would. He. And he didn't trip. Anybody could come in there and vibe. He, you know, it didn't mess up his work. It wasn't nothing. It was just like, you know, just good times and good vibes and watching that dude build a fucking masterpiece. Yeah, speaking of masterpiece, when Ready, when Ready to Die dropped, it's an instant classic. Instant. What's your favorite songs on that album? Everyday Struggle is my favorite. Um, Unbelievable. Uh, Things Done Change. One more chance, the original, the one that's on the album. Mm -hmm. And uh I'll probably say the what? Even though the whole album is fucking crazy. You just asked me my favorite. Like shit I can still listen to. I mean, I throw that album on sometimes now. Like when I'm working out, running on the treadmill, 
I run for 50 minutes. So I just throw that album on and just let it, don't skip it, no nothing, just let that shit run through. But Everyday Struggle is like my, that's my favorite Biggie record of all times. From Ready to Die to Life After Death, that's my favorite Biggie song. Why? What he was talking about, you know what I mean? Like he was just detailing just that, that life. And I like it because I'm like, yo, he was like, he young. Just the the delivery, the way he was just flowing on that shit and just the metaphors. And I was just like, yo, this dude is fucking, I got P-A-I-D. That's why my moms hate me. She was forced to kick me out, no doubt. And I figured out, and it was for 20s down south. I'm like, yo, what? Like, <laughs> and that was real life stuff happening. Just knowing like, you know, dudes from New York was like, yo, nah, you go get more money out of town. You know, and my bitch, I swear to God, she won't snitch. Told me once to hit the bricks, I made the hooker rich. Conspiracy <laughs> should be home in three years till then. I looks out for the whole family. A true G, that's me blowing like a bubble. Like his, it was just the, I'm just like, yo, dog, this, this nigga is nasty. I don't know who's fucking with him. And you know, don't, we ain't saying that because he's from the hood. No, like, nah, dog, I just don't think lyrically nobody's dealing with this dude right now. You know what I mean? So that's why it was just the, just the delivery, the, the flow, just the whole concept. It was just like, that's to this day, I can listen to that song on repeat for hours. Damn, that was a hard song. And even yeah. as you was going over them verses, I'm like, my God, that brother was gifted. Seeing body after body in the mayor Giuliani ain't trying to see no black man turn to John Gotti. Woo. My daughter used to party, so she's older now. Educated street knowledge, I'm a molder now. Like his... No 20 year old supposed to be saying stuff like that. Hard. Sometimes. Like, what are Hard. you talking about? You know what I'm saying? Like, nah, that record always get me all the time, though. Okay. Everything's going good, but as you know, you know, when things go good, it, it's a yin and a yang in this world. No doubt. It, it got to balance out with the bad. Mm -hmm. uh, Tupac comes back into the story, gets robbed, shot, Quad Studios. Mm hmm. You saw Tupac coming in the building, correct? Yeah. What what was going on? You went out onto the terrace and so on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We was actually, um, it was the first Junior Mafia session that we had when we got signed. Okay. You know what I'm saying? We just got signed and it was our first studio session. And we was in the recording and play as Anthem. Clark Kent, you know, of course, you know, Un was in there, you know, because Un was partners with Big with Undears and Big and, and, and the Mafia. So we's all mm -hmm. in there, you know, we all geeked up our first session, you know, we happy, we hype as fuck, you know what I'm saying? We got some advance money ourselves now, you know what I mean? Shit lit, you know what I'm saying? So me and Nino just went on the terrace, like, yo, let's go, let's go smoke. We're gonna go smoke one by ourselves, you know, it was a bunch of weed in there, like, yo, let them smoke. Me and you gonna rub and go on the terrace, you know what I'm saying? And me and him were just sitting in there just having one of the moments, like, yo, can you believe it? Like, yo, dog, like, oh shit, this shit really real. Like, yo, we got a deal. Like, you know, we just kids, we hype. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. And some told me to look over, because if you know, of course we high up, you know, I'm looking over and I see like a few dudes walking down the block. I'm like, I see the bandana. He's always wearing that bandana and shit. So I'm like, and we of course we've been hanging around him a few times. You know what I mean? So I, I know when I see him. Mm -hmm. so I'm looking down, I'm like, they're like Tupac. And we knew Stretch too. God bless the dead, uh, Stretch as well. God bless uh RP Tupac. And uh, I knew both of them. So I could just see. I know how Pac walk and all that. So I'm like, oh shit, I look like Pac. Yo, and I'm yelling like, yo, Pop. And he looked up, he looking, he couldn't see us. You know, he looking up, he like, who that? I'm like, yo, this C's, Lil C's, what's up? He, who? Lil C's. Yo, what's up, little nigga? What's good? I said, yo, what up? Which, where you going? He said, where y'all at? I said, yo, I'm gonna come downstairs. I said, yo, come around the corner. Cause you know how the terrace was in, in Quad, you know, it's on the yeah. side. It's on yeah. 48th Street. And you know, yeah. it's on 7th. So I'm like, yo, come around the corner. Come around to the corner and I'm gonna come downstairs and get you. I go back in the room, I tell Big, I'm like, yo, Big, Pac downstairs. He like, you lying. I'm like, nah, dead ass, he downstairs. He was like, oh, all right, go get him. No regular shit, like, all right, go grab him. That's when me and Nino get into the elevator and we go downstairs. But Nino, crazy shit is, Nino heard the shots before we got downstairs. He was like, yo, you oh. heard that shit? I was like, nah, I don't hear nothing, but I know Pac got some bomb ass weed, my nigga. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's, you know, I'm like, man, we're about to get high as fuck. You know what I'm saying? But Nino heard it. And when we got downstairs, you know how narrow the elevator yeah, from the wall is. You know what I'm yep. saying? When the door opened, the first person I seen was Stretch. He was, he was tall. Because Stretch is like six feet. And he was moving his feet from the door. But I'm thinking, like, I see, like, and I see the, his other homeboy. I'm like, what the fuck? These niggas drunk playing? And when I was about to walk out, 
two dudes came from both sides. Get the fuck back in the elevator. Oh, Ooh. shit. Got me and Nino step back in, and they just holding the guns at us. And I'm hitting, I was so paranoid and nervous, I'm hitting door open. Now I'm like, the door just did, and they like this. And when the door finally started closing, they went back to them. Start just like, mm -hmm. you know, grabbing them niggas up and all type of shit. And me and Nino just looked at each other like, yo, like, y'all understand, dog, we 15, 16. So we like, yo, I go back upstairs. I'm like, yo, B.I., Pac downstairs getting robbed right now. He like, stop playing with me. I'm like, yo, I'm dead ass, dog. And he saw my face and he saw Nino face too. He like, yo, nah. He like, y'all niggas stay right here. I'll be right back. He went downstairs. He ain't come back for like, he ain't come upstairs. He never came back up. 15, 20 minutes. Then we all like, fuck that. We're going downstairs. Anything could be going on. You know what I'm saying? When we went downstairs. That's when the police was taking everybody, grabbing you, pulling you to the side, getting your information, saying Tupac got shot. And that was it from there. We, we stayed downstairs, gave them all that information. And that's when they welded them out, coming downstairs in the, on the stretcher. And that was the last time we saw him from that moment. You know, they, they put him in the joint. They took all our information and they let us go. But people so don't... But people Go don't ahead. know, you know, I don't know why people always get the story twisted. And if people ever see me tell the story, I, to I told it the same way over a hundred times. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't coming there to see us. Coincidence that he was coming to that studio. I didn't know that. You know what I'm saying? I'm just acknowledging him because that's the homeboy. You know what I'm saying? And I, if I see him, I'm going to acknowledge you. And I came downstairs to come get you. You know what I'm saying? But he was already coming in there to record with somebody else. We didn't know that. That was just us being homeboys and being cool with him. I see him, I acknowledge him. Tell me, yo, come upstairs. Nigga, the whole crew up here. You know what I'm saying? Big up here. I'm going to come get you for him. And when I went downstairs, that's the madness I ran into. Down there. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So he wasn't coming there to see us. People always be like, yo, nah, he didn't come there to see us. He was, he was coming there to record with somebody else. We don't know. It's different floors in, in, in Quad Studio. We don't know where he was going, what he was doing there, but I acknowledged him to let him know we was there. If you're going to line somebody up, I might have just did it myself. Why would I let him know I'm in the building and we all here? Yeah, and somebody going to be downstairs ready to rob your ass too. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, nah, that was Big real, Like, nah, Big was really homeboys with him. That was really like our homie. We really was fucking with him really tough. You know what I'm saying? Right after that happened, Tupac claims that Big distanced himself from him. And he also starts saying, yo, Big set me up. Mm -hmm. Was y'all like, yo, what could even make you think something like that? Because everything that you're saying right now, it ain't just like Big had love for Pac. All of y'all had love yeah, for Pac. for it sure. For sure. I, I did. I mean, I embraced that dude like he was a brother. You know what I mean? Because he embraced us like that. You know what I mean? Like, you know, he ain't say my name and hit him up for nothing. You know what I mean? Like, he mentioned Junior Mafia, but he mentioned me personally because- we had a relationship like that as well. You know what I'm saying? Like, he always knew, like, I love this little dude. This little dude's a gangster right here. I like this little kid right here. You know what I mean? Because I was always just, you know, genuine with him as as, I, as genuine, genuine as I was with B.I. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So um, I ain't never hear about him dissing himself because right after that happened, you know, he went to court and then went to jail. You know what I mean? So we didn't get a chance to do no. You know, right after he got shot, he went to court and he got found guilty. He went to jail. So we didn't even get a chance to really... Try to do anything. We we'll try to reach out to him. We we'll try to talk. He, you know, from there he went straight to court, and he got found guilty. He was in jail from there. So you know what I mean? It wasn't nothing about us distancing ourselves from him. You know what I mean? Because we didn't know what was really going on. We didn't know he felt that way at first. Like you know what I mean? Mm. Like you know, we didn't think he felt like we had something to do with that. You know what I'm saying? Like we thinking like, all right, he, he, I'm sure he know what's going on with him, but I'm sure he know we ain't have nothing to do with that. You know what I'm saying? Like, and then that ain't start happening until like maybe like. Uh, couple of weeks or months after where, you know, people that we all knew each other from was like, yo, he think y'all did that or y'all had something to do with that. Then it went from y'all knew about it or y'all knew who did it. Like, nah, dog, we don't, we don't know nothing. We didn't even know you was coming there. That's, that's your situation. Outside of us, he had other people in New York that he was cool with, that he dealt with. You know what I mean? He dealt with us on our time, what he wanted mm. to do. But outside of that, he had friends and people here. So we didn't know, we didn't know what was going on with him. That, and that wasn't nothing for us to know. You know how New York is. New Yorkers are very like, I'm about me and my crew. Mind your business. We don't dip and dab and nothing else. You might deal with a certain crew I don't deal with. Yo, fam, you go chill with them. I'll holler at you later. I'm going to be on this end. Hit me when you're done with that. No issues mm. with them, but no, I, no, we don't, I don't know them like that. 
You know what I mean? And you know how New York is. Sometimes you don't want to get to know certain people. You don't want to get to deal with certain people because they may be in a, a certain mix you're not in. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, that's our thing here. In L.A., it may be a little different with the gang culture. And, you know, everybody's supposed to expect everybody to know something. Here, it's like, nah, it wasn't like that. You know, it's, this is a very, like, mind your business type of city. You know how it is here. Like, Absolutely, you know I mean? yeah. yeah. We're not getting into nobody else's shit. But, nah, we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know about that situation. And we was really waiting to hear from him to see what he knew. But we never got a chance to, Big never got a chance to talk to him after that. Damn, I mean, um, everything went left from there. And I yeah, know y'all yeah. had, because even even as you talking, it's it's clear to see you got love for that brother Pop. No doubt. Even to this day. No doubt. Uh, yeah. I want to Even through all the bullshit, like, you know, that nigga done said shit about us and, did, you know, like, but even after that, you know what I mean? Like, it was just like, yo, dog, you know, he bugging. But, you know, uh, that man gone right now. And, and that was a senseless situation. Senseless situation with B.I., you know what I mean? But, no. I'm talking from a standpoint before the drama. No, nah, it was love. It was genuine. You know what I'm saying? Like, we genuinely had love for him. On the strength of B.I. You know what I mean? If B.I. accepted something and loved it, it was our job to love it, too. Because we knew what he was doing for Big. You know what I mean? It wasn't like he was doing what Puff was doing, but just the knowledge. And just mm -hmm. dealing with Big and letting Big come rock with him. That was love. Why would Big do something like that to somebody that's showing you love? At the same time, Big had a promising career. You know what I'm saying? Like, his career was very promising at that point. Why would... I do that to my homeboy. That's actually helping me. You know what I'm saying? Like, nah, we don't give it up like that. Mm -hmm. And never gave it up like that. You know what I mean? I know you said y'all was in the studio um, getting started on the Junior Mafia project. Yeah. First album. Mm -hmm. Is it true that Foxy Brown was supposed to be a member of the group in the early days? I mean, Big was trying to put some stuff together. I can't really clarify like that because sometimes, you know, sometimes it's just crazy shit in Big Head. You know what I'm saying? But... Everybody was on cool times at that time. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Like it wasn't, you know, her and Kim wasn't, you know, they wasn't at each other next at that time. It was really like, it's like a Brooklyn thing. We always from the same neighborhood. Foxy is from where we was from. You know what I mean? You know, at, at one point, her and Kim was friends. You know, you see the Total video. They did mm -hmm. the Source magazine together. So it's not like, it could not be true. But, you know, Big was trying to line something up. He was just trying to like, just grasp everything that was from the neighborhood. You know what I mean? But I ain't never hear he was trying to like, really put her in the group. But... You know, he was really trying to deal with her on some music shit just as, you know, but Kim was the main culprit, you know, for, for us with our group and everything. You know what I'm saying? Got you. How much of that album did Biggie um, write? Because I heard that Big reference most, wrote and referenced most of those songs. Is that true? Nah, nah. I mean, maybe I would say half. No, not even half. I would say like 40. I mean, because like I said, a lot of the rappers from Junior Mafia actually rapped. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Like Chico, he didn't write Chico stuff. He didn't know. Kim was writing. And uh, Trife was writing, Bang was writing. Like I said, I was the only one out of my group that wasn't really like the writer. You know, you got to think about it. People don't even know this. I was only on two songs on the Junior Mafia album. Damn. I was on Player's Anthem and I was on Realms of Junior Mafia. I just was on a big record, the first single. You know what I mean? So that kind of put a light on me. You know what I'm saying? Like, and then just being around rocking with Big. I think more of my, I think more of my shine and people more recognizing me came from Big shouting me out than me being on songs. You know what I'm saying? His yeah. records was a lot more bigger, and it was more out there. And he just said my name. He said my name more than I was on the Mafia album. I was on two songs on there. People don't realize that. But you know, nah, a lot I of didn't that even writing, know that. A lot of people don't know that. I don't know if they realize it, but you listen to the Mafia album now. I'm on two songs. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about one of them two songs. Players anthem, mm -hmm. monster hit. Yeah. Um, you, Big, and Kim. How did that song come together? Uh, that was, you know, big, uh, of course he picked the beats. That was him and Clark. Clark came and played that beat for him one day and B, I was like, let me take this in the studio. I got this. And that was the first night. Clark was in there that, Clark was in there that day with us too when we did the session. That was the first song we did. And Shout Big went in there and laid down his verse and laid down the reference for me. I went into another little room and sat in there with it in some headphones. Then I came back out like an hour later and did my verse. And, and, and that's how the song just got put together. That was him doing the hook. That dude was just a super creator, dog. Like, you know, like his vision was just like, it was different. And all we had to do was just follow suit. Yo, he used to be like, yo, just listen. I ain't going to steal y'all wrong. Follow my lead. Did he write that hook? Hell yeah. Because that hook was dope. Hell yeah. That hook, I think he did the Realms of Junior Mafia hook. And all the other type of songs, you know, he was letting the Mafia do them. Like Murder Ones, you know. Trife and Lawson them did that. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh. 
the smoking that dank joint uh, with Trife and them. Like the writers was, he was letting them be creative. And that's what was inspiring them. That was that's what was motivating them. He would hear a record, and we all would be like, "I right, he about to come in here, listen to this shit. Uh, he might shoot this shit down. He'll come in there and be like, oh, nah, this shit dope. Just fix this part. And you know what? Let me go in there and do some ad-libs over y'all vocals. Or he'll tell them, yo, go nah, say this, say, say this part twice. Or nah, do this part this way. He'll just come in there and just like, you know, organize shit to make sure it sounded good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, um, that was a dope time, man. Like, man, it was the best time. Best time. You'll best, never yeah. get those, we'll never get those times back. You know what I mean? That's why they so, you know, those times is precious, man. You know, those times are historical. Yeah. Especially the 90s. And that and that little short span of 93 to 97, I mean, you know, it's forever be historical because we, them years we lost two of the most influential the artists at that time. You yep. will never forget about that. And at that time, so much music was growing. It was so versatile. Wu Tang, you had fucking, you had Buster, you had Nas, you had Red Man with the What album, you had Meth with the solo album, you had Raekwon and Ghost only built for Cuban Links. So did you had Tribe? It was just so many different. Yeah, and at the Snoop, same time, music, the at West the same Coast. Time, it was yeah. just so musically like everything was different. Nobody sounded the same. It was all raw, original shit, naughty. You know what I mean? It was just an EPMD. You know, all these motherfuckers were still lit and still moving and shaking. It was just a, it was just a very big, big, big time in music. You know what I'm saying? We and we ain't gonna never get that again. Yeah, and especially for you, the first, like players anthem, you lead on the song. You got the first verse, and. It goes um gold. Y'all got a gold single out the gate. No doubt. So your whole life just changed off the rip. Then y'all come back with Get Money, which is another monster. We did the one with Aaliyah before that, though, first. R.I.P. to Aaliyah. We did I Need You Tonight. That was with Trife, uh, Klepto, and Kim. We did That's that the one. only... That was the only song that Big wasn't on on that album, right? Nah, he wasn't on a lot of songs on the Mafia album. He was only on Get Money. The only single, I mean. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the only single he wasn't on. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was the one. And you know, the original one, Faith was on that. But we couldn't get Faith clear. She's on the hook on the on the album version. And then we wound up getting Aaliyah to actually do the video version to it. And then we the third single was Get Money. With Big. Yeah. And Kim was on all the singles because Kim was the... She was the one pushing the envelope. Like, she really wanted to do that shit. She was dead ass serious. And she just stood out. Out of all the other motherfuckers, like it's, you know, of course, it's a pretty little young chick. She's standing out between eight little motherfuckers. You know what I'm saying? And she's spitting that shit too, like a nigga. So you know, she was she was next up with that shit. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, man, it was a beautiful time. They don't call it the golden era of rap for for no reason. No doubt, y'all had a gold album. You know, it, just amazing time. Yeah, you know, Tupac. Bringing him back into the story right around this time, he gets sentenced. He's um, locked up for sexual assault, mm -hmm. and Big drops, "Who shot you?" Mm -hmm. Number one, just to clear the air, was this record made to have anything to do with that incident at Quad? No, nah, not at all. Not at all. That record had nothing to do with Quad, and I told this over a hundred times before. And you can go on YouTube and look it up. The first time Big did that first verse to that song, it was for Mary J. It was for her second album, My Life. That's supposed to have been the intro. The original Who Shot Your Song is Keith Murray, LL Cool J, and Big. Puff Daddy scratched the record off the intro because, like, this is too hard for an R&B song. <laughs> like, I, I can't put this on an R&B album. It's just, you know what I'm saying? So that record was done before that even happened. What Big did was, all right, let me get the song. I'm going to throw another verse on it. And he kept the record. And I, I you know what I think? Because uh, I actually talked to, um, who I talked to about that? I don't know if it was Young Noble. Because, you know, I, I fuck with the Outlaws. Shout out to the Outlaws, Young Noble, mm -hmm. E.I. You know, R.I.P. to uh, Fatal, Gaddafi. Those are my brothers. So we talked about that. And they was like, you know, we just, they felt like, Probably, it was just the timing of it. And you know, back in them times, we didn't think about timing on records. You know, we wasn't controlling when music come out at that time. Yeah. You get yeah. what I'm saying? Like, you know, 
Puff Daddy gonna let us know, yo, I'm doing the B-side. He's just gonna drop it. B, I'm not gonna buy. Nah, don't put that out right now. That wasn't on your conscience when your conscience is totally innocent. You know what I mean? You're not thinking like, oh, I'll put this out right now. I don't want him to trip about this. It's like, you're mm -hmm. not, you're thinking he don't even, he, he know about this record. He know about this. He ain't, you know, we, that's not on your mind at that time. It was just a B-side song and the shit took off and then we hear about that. Like, he think that record is about him. He know that record is old. That record been done. That was done six months ago when they supposed to have been on Mary J album. So if you go on YouTube, you might hear a little bit of it. And when you go on Mary album, you'll hear a little bit of Keith Murray rhyming to that beat. <laughs> mm. Turn on the Mary intro album to my life and you'll hear Keith Murray rhyming to that shit, like to the intro to it. He's rhyming to a little bit of Who Shot You. So the record is old. It wasn't about that. I just think the timing of it. As I look back today on it, yeah, the timing probably could have been wrong, but that wasn't in... It wasn't in our control. We didn't think like that. When you just know you ain't have nothing to do with nothing and nothing is about nobody, you're not thinking that way. Like, yo, let me be cautious about how I put this record out when I put it out. I, you know you're my homeboy, and I know you know this record wasn't about you. You know it was done before you. Why would I have, why would I have to think that way? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I just think that's just what it was at that time. You know what I mean? But everybody in the world know that record was done way before that. So definitely wasn't about Tupac in the Quad situation. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to put that question out there just to put it to rest. I mean, that record was clearly made before that incident even took place. Yeah, and it's facts on these. I ain't you ain't got to believe yeah. me. Yeah, you could go, you could go search it, Google it. Like I said, throw on the Mary J album or go on YouTube. I'm sure YouTube be having everything. I'm sure it's still on there. It was on there before, and you could punch it up. That record was done before that. All right, so Pac eventually gets bailed out, mm -hmm. heads on over to Death Row. Um, one incident that now now the, the 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 fire is starting to flame a little bit higher, mm -hmm. right? Um, what started out as a little, just a little spark, yeah, it's really starting to blow now. Was mm -hmm. you was you there for the Source Awards when Suge got on stage and yeah. said the whole you was there? Yeah, yeah, that was before Tupac got released though. Yes, it yeah, was that before. was before Tupac got released. What was it like? Because now this is starting to feel like it's bigger than just two people. Yeah. Now it's starting to feel like, all oh, right, once upon a time, two artists might not be seeing eye to eye, but now you got two record execs and it's feeling like it's turning into a coast versus a coast. Yeah. So when Suge did that, did it catch all y'all off guard? Hell yeah, because we didn't think it was, we didn't know about it. I didn't know if him and Puff had no, we didn't know about them having no issues and situations like that. We didn't think nothing of it because while we was there doing rehearsals and things like that, we was actually seeing them, seeing dad, seeing what's up with dad, seeing Snoop, what up? And, you know, everything was all fine. We think that everything is all love. You know what I mean? They had other issues going on in there. You know what I'm saying? I think MCA was like beefing with, uh, what's the, uh, DJ Quick. It was like, it was other shit going on in there. Bone Thugs was beefing with, I think, with Death Row at that time with the Easy E shit. Like, but it was it was cordial and mutual with us. We didn't think nothing of the situation because we didn't know that they was trying to sign Tupac or this and that. We didn't know nothing that was going on. So everything was all love until he got on that stage and, and said that shit. We was like, whoa, everybody looking at each other like, huh? Really? Oh man, shit could have, yo, shit could have went different in there. But, you know. Puff being Puff, nah, we not going to go that route. We mm -hmm. not going to go that route. We going to let it be, but nah. The the, the Brooklyn niggas, <laughs> the Biggie yeah. niggas, you know, nah, niggas, you know, it, it, they was ready to get it on and popping. But, you know, Puff, you know, Big really trusted Puff and, and, and took Puff word. Like, nah, we not going to go that route, dog. And we just, you know, kind of just let it be. You see what Puff got on stage and did tell the opposite. Mm -hmm. After a man dissed him, he got up there and was like, yo, I got love for the brother. He's cool, you know, you know, misunderstanding or whatever he said up there. But, you know, we took it for what it was worth. Like, I, right, you know, we ain't really with that type of vibe right now. But, you know, Puff is the one that's responsible for putting Big in the position where he at. And Big saying, chill, stand down. And that's what we did. We just kind of just let it be. You know, Puff clearly had a major impact on Big because at some point, you know, after Pac get out, he releases Hit Him Up. Yeah. And, you know, your name is mentioned three times in that song. <laughs> 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 like I'm the, like I'm that nigga. I wasn't even like, but it's like I said, the relationship, he knew the relationship. Anytime he was seeing big, it's 90% chance you saw me with him. 
You know what I mean? It's times I saw Pac by myself and I used to have to go take him stuff for big. You know what I mean? I go drop him off some shit he needed bigger, but like, yo, go take this to Pac. He at the Millennium Hotel. I, I jump on the Iron Horse, go see him, and I'm like, here, Big told me to bring it to you. Come here, little nigga, smoke one with me. One day I smoked so much weed with that nigga, that nigga fell asleep. I tapped him and was like, yo, <laughs> yo, I'm leaving, dog. <laughs> he was on his bed, knocked out, but that's, you no. Know, he always like, yo, nah, come smoke. I fucked with you, little nigga. Like, he had to sit there and kick it to me sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Yo, so where was you the first time that you heard that record? Uh, well, down or was away. your phone blowing up? Like, yo, you gotta hear this. No, nah, I wasn't really no real phones and shit like that. But you'll get the word. You know what I'm saying? Like, and uh, I forgot. Somebody said something. We was down the way somewhere, and I think we we sat in the car, and, and somebody played it, and I was just like, "Wow, really?" It wasn't unexpected because I knew him, so I knew what he was about. If he felt the way about something. I knew, he's going he's gonna to speak on it. So we already kind of knew it was a little tension from thinking about the Hushacha. So it's like, but I didn't think he was going to go that hard. Like, the motherfucker mm -hmm. with, like, it's probably one of the hardest diss tracks ever in fucking uh, rap music. Like, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, it is. And uh, yeah, first instincts, you heat it. Like, what? Oh, you know, Mafia, we like, oh, we got to do it, bro. We're about, to, uh, we're about to respond to this shit, my nigga. And Big heard it, and Big was like, all right, you know, he was pissed. But then he was like, if anybody do a record responding to that shit, don't bother calling me. Don't bother coming around me. I will not fuck with you if anybody uh, do a record to this. Because, you know, you know, Junior Mafia got their own art. They rap. They He like, yo, you do that shit, I'm not fucking with you. I just think Big Total Attentions was like, yeah, he was heated about it. But, you know, his thing was, I want to get up with this dude. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want to I see if this energy will be when he see me. You know what I mean? Because he knew Pac just as well. Like, you know what I mean? Pac could do something like that and then to turn around and go, me and my big mouth, I was just tripping. You know, I said this, and I think Big was just like trying to make that opportunity available. Like before we go hard and make this any worse, and you know, and make the situation more bigger than what it is. I want to try to reach out to him. So Big really asked the whole mafia, stand down, that, like do. Yeah, yeah and, and we was ready to do a record. Clep was ready. Kim was ready. <laughs> did did y'all have a record? Did y'all? I heard y'all had a record called "Dig 'Em Up." Is it? Nah. Is nah, that real? Nah, nah, hell no. Nah, we ain't doing records unless somebody snuck a record. <laughs> but nah, nobody did no record. Um, nah, nobody did no records. You know what I'm saying? Like our whole thing was, you know, you know, when people talking street shit like that back in them times, you know, motherfuckers from New York don't want to make shit hot. So I'm not, you know, big thing was if it's really a real situation, I'm not gonna take it to. We're not gonna take it to music, and you know that's how police and people get involved. You know, and nah, if we're gonna see each other, let's just see each other, type of thing. You know what I mean? I'm not going to entertain this. This is not what we do. But mm. that wasn't the situation with Pac. His situation with Pac was I just want to talk to him, and like, like that was Big friend. You know, Big was mad, but he was hurt too. Like, damn dog, like you coming at me like this, like nigga, I was your man. You knew everything about me. I knew everything about you. Like, you know, what I'm mean? dog. You knew where my mom stayed. You knew what my you knew what my daughter stayed at. You knew my block. Like nah, I wouldn't, you know, Big was more hurt than anything. You know what I mean? So that's why he didn't want to do no record and all. He was just like, you know what? I'm busy. Let me just continue to work. I'm not going to even sweat that shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, that take it take a big person, man, to really like because like you said, that, that was it was a diss record, but that was also a hit record. Like yeah, like, you know what I mean? Like record, you, you walking in places, they playing this shit. You yeah, know what I'm like just because it's dope, even to this day. I don't yeah. tip off it now, you know what I mean? It's it's a totally different ball game now. But I walk in clubs, they will play that shit, and I just I, I laugh at it now, you know what I mean? I'm like, you know, shit. At the end of the day, let me tell you something. Your name coming out of Tupac's mouth at that time, it's like Drake saying your name now, or Drake jumping yeah. on a, Drake jumping on the, your song right now. Your shit is tuned. All right, Tupac said my name. It's one of the most biggest motherfuckers. Like, okay, that's how I had to take the the good out of it. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like I, right. and that's just what the. That's what the game was back then. It was very competitive. People spoke their minds. They spoke how they felt. But, you know, of course, we was hurt that he, you know, he ain't had to go that far, go that route. You know what I mean? But that's just what it was back then. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, um, like I said, you know, with the good, the bad always is right behind it. Yeah. Um, you know, Big get to work on his second album, Life After Death. Mm -hmm. And... From what I hear, he was in the studio recording Nasty Girl when the word got out that she, Tupac was shot. Mm -hmm. Was you with him that night in the studio? 
when he did Nasty Girl? Was that? Yeah, yeah, I was there. I, I thought that was the part where you said, uh, I thought that was the day he died. Because we was home when- No, the, when he got we shot. Was, yeah, yeah, it was fire. He ain't died till like five days later. Yeah, yeah, I was there when, I was there when he did that. So how did y'all even come to learn about that? Did somebody just come to the studio like, yo? Yeah, you know when there'd be a bunch of people in the studio and shit, and somebody came in there and was like, yo, um, Tupac just got shot in Vegas. Of course, you know, back in them days, you know, you didn't get the word quick as you'll get the word now. You could just yeah. go through Instagram and stroll through a Twitter and hear something. Or somebody could hit your phone and tell you you saw this. Like back then, it, it wasn't like that. You know what I mean? Somebody, you had to get that word from a, like a high up or that shit had, you had to be somebody important to the way that shit traveled all the way to New York. You know what I mean? And yeah, so when we got that word, yeah, Big was, you know, we were sad about that shit, man. Yeah. You know, no matter what we was going through. We ain't wish that on nobody. You know what I'm saying? Like, definitely not. No matter what was going on. You got history with somebody. Outside of all the shit, you can recover from somebody dissing you on the song. You know what I'm saying? But you can't recover from shit like that. We wasn't out there wishing a man get shot or we want to shoot him. It wasn't no thing. We didn't want to make a record about him. You know what I'm saying? Like, nah. You know what I mean? So that shit definitely hurt big because it's like, while all this shit going on, you can't even be there for your homie or really just like, or get a cordial situation or get an understanding. It's like, you know, like, oh shit, like, you know, we were just more shocked than anything. Yeah, like when, when Pac did pass, you know, Faith said that she remembered Big calling her and he was actually crying on the phone. Yeah, no, he teared up. When we sat there and like we we watching, this this one we just moved to uh, Glen Point. We just moved to Jersey. Crib, gated, you know, like we, and we had this big screen TV and that shit came up and I called him downstairs. Like, hide the movie. Like, yo, yo, B.I., come here. Like, yo, look. And he just sat there and just just stared at the TV, just like stared at the TV for like five minutes and just put his head down. Just like, you know, like it was fucked up. You know what I mean? Like so that shit hit him. Even bro. through it all, is it was all love. Yeah. Like yo, damn. Yeah, dog. You know, like come on, imagine that. Imagine, you know, having a bond with somebody and being cool with somebody, and then y'all have a falling out and something happened to him, and you don't get a chance to to fix that situation. You know what I'm saying? You so leave offline. It on that, Offline, they never got a chance to meet or never got a chance to get on the phone and just like, yo, this is what it really is. Like, nah. I ain't had nothing to do with that. Nah, they never got a chance to talk. But, you know, when I talk to when I talk to the outlaws, they always tell me the story about how when he was on, when he was in Vegas before he was about to leave, like before that happened to him, they told me that he said, yo, when he get back to LA, he was going to fix everything with Big. And this is what the outlaws told me. I'm telling you something the outlaws told me. And then, if you really look at, do your research, you listen to some of the last interviews that Tupac done, you hear him starting to like, he was starting to open up to it. Like, you know, I would hear him talk, it won't be crazy stuff about B.I. He would more talk like, yo, don't blame us for this, you know, for what this, you know, blame the media for this, you know. Don't think we caused all this. And then I heard one interview, he was like, yo, you know, I, I squash things with Big if we could do something for charity or something like that. Like, mm -hmm. you could, so it was things that you was hearing that, 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 that you can tell he was kind of like, easing up on it and was more probably like leaning towards like, you know what? It's about time I'm done with this shit. Cause we didn't feed into it. So he didn't have nothing to bounce back off it either. Like to be like, all right, fuck that. They said this and did that. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't nothing. He's like, he like, yo, all right. He took that blow and he ain't come back at me. You know what? Cause he knew, who, he knew who Big was too. Just like Big knew who he was. You know what I'm saying? And um, yeah, they didn't get a chance to, to, to sit down and kick it, man. So yeah, that definitely, you know, that definitely put a lot of pain on Big. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I could imagine, man. During during the recording of that second album, um, you and Big get arrested for weed possession. Um, and the car got repossessed or something like that. Mm -hmm. Then Big go out and he chooses Chevy Lumina. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Say he wanted to ride low key. Yo, was you like, yo, are you kidding me? You Definitely. notorious B.I.G. now. What are you doing in the Chevy Lumina? I said, yo, dog, for real, you want this? Cause you know, you they're supposed to give you a loaner's car. We giving them a fucking Lexus truck. You know, that's when they had the Lexus Land Cruisers. You know, we come out the precinct, I our car wouldn't start. They uh -huh. so they towed it off and untook us home. And then the next day we go up there, I'm like, all right, probably, they'll probably give us a little another Lexus truck or a Lexus car. They come out with the Lumina van. I'm like, yo, you <laughs> draw this? Be I like, yeah, perfect. Perfect. Fuck you mean perfect. Hop in, nigga. <laughs> I got in driver's seat. I'm driving. And the dude we used to buy the cars from, he's he's in front of me. 
Before we even got out, I hit the back of him once already because the brakes were shot. The ship was on the rotors. Big never drove before, don't know how to drive. So he understands none of my lingo. I'm like, yo, B.I., these brakes is fucked up. He like, yo, dog, just, we just got locked up. Niggas, he like, yo, just strive. We need to be low key anyway. I'm like, yo, but these brakes is shut. I just ran into the, I just ran into the salesman that we get the car from. Drive, dog. All right. Gets on the highway. And, uh, you know, we paid the toll. You know that uh, north and south? I get on the joint to hit that turn. And the car just... And we wind up skirting all the way to the other side of the highway. And mm. ran dead into a rail. Boom! My face hit the steering wheel. I think Charlie almost, Charlie Baltimore was in the car with us. She almost went through the window. Damn. And B.I. was stuck in the car. He could, his leg, he couldn't get out the car. So we had to wait for somebody. You know, I'm leaking blood out my mouth. Shit leaking. And uh, they had to get, they had to wait for somebody to come and take off the door. So he didn't get him out because he couldn't move his leg. Yo, and, um, you, you, you know Gene Deal. Yeah. Hmm? OG security. He yeah. said, Gene said that that accident was a result of Tupac's death because Big was so upset. He was so devastated that he got smoked out of his mind, gave uh, Lucy's the keys, they got smoked out their mind and they had an accident and Big went through the car window. Could have killed, it could, he could have been dead then. He broke okay, both so, of the fibular so, so, bones in his body. So you're saying that accident that happened between Big and Lil C's, the car accident, was almost like a side effect of Tupac dying. Yeah, that night. That, 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 it, was, it was like when he oh. heard the news, it was that night. Or the, uh. You know what I'm saying? He gets smokes out of his mind because, yo, the kid was hurt. You know what I mean? This this don't set, This just sound like the rotors was bad, like they had bad brakes on that joint. <laughs> Gee, my man, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't know what that means. What the All fuck right. that? I, nah, we got into a car accident. I'm telling you from my perspective how it happened. The brakes was fucked up on that shit. I was driving it. I know for a fact. And it was a little raining out there too. And we wasn't going fast either. Like I said, we just paid the toll and we was going to where the, the north-south things separate. I was turning around the bend and that shit just started going crazy. And I wound up running into the rail. That was it. Mm. Uh, Biggie wasn't driving, so what would it do for him to be upset <laughs> about Tupac? He wasn't, he wasn't driving. He wasn't in control of the car. I was. I was driving. And that's just Got the result you. to what happened. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, if if you want to think about it in that mysterious world way, like of just something coming back to you type of thing, I don't, I don't get that. You know what I'm saying? How long was Big in the hospital behind that? Because I know he shattered his leg. Uh, Shit, about five months. Six months. Damn. Because he had a pin. He had, a, uh, he had one of them big ass rods on his leg that had two mm -hmm. pins going through it. One at the bottom. One at the top. And he had to sit like that for about two months. And then from there, he had to go to therapy, too, to, to learn how to, like, you know, to get muscle back in his leg. So for a while, he was in the wheelchair for a while. And then by the time we started doing the hypnotized video, that was the first time he actually walked with crutches. Like, he was walking on his own. So he was yeah. like that. Yeah, he was like that for about a good six months. Yeah, but that just show how prolific this man is because he took that incident and one of my favorite songs, The Long Kiss Goodnight, Crazy Verse. You still tickle me. I used to be as strong as Ripple be to Lil C's, C's cripple, cripple me. Oh, I didn't know. First line, though, I make your mouth be so beast like Deloise. When I mm. lose, you lose teeth like Lil C's. He already done shot me down because I had to, <laughs> I mean, I ain't, I, 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 eventually I'm going to have to get these shits taken out at one point. Because that's why that's how I wound up getting these gold fronts so they could save the four teeth that I had there. Cause I didn't feel mm -hmm. like getting no dentures at 17 years old. So they was like, hey, the only way you can save these is if we put something on to protect them. And that's what happened. That's how I wound up getting these fronts. That's how it became infamous for me from that. So he already blew me. I didn't care about the cripple me part, but this yo, know, goddamn, bro. You gotta like, but like I said, <laughs> he was so in tune with just speaking about life. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, nah, it is what it is. And you gotta take that one, nigga. You fuck my leg up. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta take this one on the chin. Yeah, man. I mean, y'all got hit after hit after hit coming around that time. Lil' Kim, she dropped her debut album, Hardcore. Mm -hmm. Yo, who do you know who came up with the concept for that album cover? Oh, uh, that was Big and Un. Iconic, iconic album. It was nobody. We was, Junior Mafia was 
uh, that was Biggie Test. That's mm-hmm. why we didn't. That's why we didn't sign the bad boy. Of course, he could have said, "Yo, pup, here, help me with, get me right with them. Let me get them on the yep. label." He said, "Nah, I'm not taking y'all to pup." You know, that's the first thing we thought about. We like, all right, big on. He got Junior Mafia. We are gonna be signed to bad boy. We are gonna be lit. He like, oh no, y'all not. <laughs> I got something I'm working on, and that's how Un came in the picture. You know, Un was in the streets. Un was trying to get out the streets. And I never shot a video before that. He never wrote a treatment concept. But B. I said, he was like, yo, whatever you tell me, I can bring it to light. And that's how him and Big partnered up with doing Undears. And we was the we was the they first group on Undears. Mm. And all them ideas was all un. The the cover, him and Big, the 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 concept to crush on you with all the colorful shit. Un and Big. It was nobody. It was no intertwining. It was no harvest, no puffs coming in like, oh, nah, you need this and you need that. We didn't have no video doc. That unshot that video, directed it, played his anthem. He did, I need you tonight, get money. All that shit was just, that was just him and Big Test right there. And we was the test of that. And Big succeeded, his first artist on his first label, Out the Water. Because I think the music spoke for itself. I just think the music is, is, what, is what won. You know what I mean? He like, yo, long as I put the long as I put the right music together, if I'm gonna create the right concept and the right ideas, we'll be out of here. And that shit was just happening for us. How did you get on that first single um off Kim's album? The Crush on You joint. Was you always on that single? It was I was the only one on it. You listen to the yeah, one on the album, and she ain't even on it. I'm I, it, it was a solo record I had for me, because it was all a setup. You know what I mean? It wasn't supposed to go on Kim's album. They were just like, all right, you know, Big had this thing in his head, like, all right, you know. After the Mafia, Kim is up first, and mm-hmm. then Caesar's up next. And whoever in the Mafia want to step up after that, you know what I mean? It was what Trife and Lawson supposed to do the solo album. But after that, he was just like, yo, whoever want to do something next after that, let's go. Y'all writers, y'all can do y'all shit, or we'll do another Mafia album. So that was just like a little setup record that he had for me. And um, we wound up throwing it on Kim album. And after no time shook shit up, uh, the radio started playing the crush on mm-hmm. out of nowhere. Yep. And this is around the time with Big passed too. Crush on you. The video went out, and he passed already. You know what I mean? So I don't know. The record just took on. It, it, it just took legs. Un came one day and was like, "Yo, Big, uh, we got a we got a problem." He like what? <laughs> he like, "Yo, uh, album doing great, but all these radio stations is playing the little C song." It's like, what are we gonna do? He's like, "Well, we gotta." Gotta put Kim on. You can't just shoot a video with her budget and her deal. You can't just shoot a video with just C's on it. And that's how, you know, she wound up going there putting her verses on it. And we shot the video for it. But it was just, it, that's just how it happened. It was like, all right, we're gonna give C's a record just to let him know he's next up. Put this record on Kim album because he's up next to do his solo album. Now, my mm-hmm. shit's supposed to be called Puppy Love. Big was gonna do my whole album. He was gonna grab Jada Kiss. He was gonna grab Mace. And he was gonna do that album. But he's like, yo, I just need a little help with this album so I won't be, it won't be all on me. And that's how he was going to put my album together. It's going to be called Puppy Love. And I was supposed to be coming next. That, and he was like, yo, you're going to be an artist that I don't want no guys. I don't want no niggas to like you. I just want you to be all for, all for the chicks. You're going to be the high school crush for all the high school girls and college girls. And you know that's why when you hear crush on you, it's a playful song. Yeah, so, yeah. I know you see me on the video. It's very girly and, and radio friendly. I didn't like it. I was like, you didn't yo, like crush on you? I hated that song, dog. Get out of here. Man, I wanted, I wanted give me your loot. I wanted warning. I wanted grab your dick, sip you love hip hop. I want fuck bitches get money, nigga. Don't put me in this one. <laughs> like, you know, he like, nigga, you better shut up, boy. This record about to have you out of here, nigga. What your little ass talking about, boy? You, you about to be so out of here. And, and look what happened. It's my biggest, biggest record to this day, dog. Yeah. The shit still rang off to this day. So, you know, it was just like he. He knew what was what, you know what I mean? I was just into it. I just wanted the, I wanted the cool shit, you know what I mean? Like, you know, outside, I'm seeing my homeboy do all the hard shit, watch him do this hard shit, I'm going to come with this. But then that's the record that, that shit won awards. She won a Soul Train Award for that. She she won awards for that joint, man. You know what I mean? So, you know, it was the it was the right path. But that was a record that was just basically set up for me to say that, you know, I was up next. It was Kim album, then C's, and it was going to be another Mafia project. Mm. Yo, you know, I gotta keep I gotta keep it in Brooklyn for a second because there's a lot of talent coming out of Brooklyn at this time. Hell yeah. As the world knows, um Jay-Z 
he's springing up around the same time. Yeah. Big and Jay got a classic record, Brooklyn's Finest. Mm -hmm. Was you there when they recorded that record? Mm -hmm. Because it really feel like them two, you know, they friends. They oh, yeah. both from, from Brooklyn, but it yeah. feel like, yo, I'm not letting this dude come harder than me on this no album, doubt. on this record. Like, what was the vibe like in the studio for that? It was dope. Dope vibe, you know, energy. Until that beat came on. Hove on one side. <laughs> Big on one side. But then get together, share some champagne. Champagne, he go right back in the corner. They go back in the corner. I'm in the back talking to Tata. D-Rock over there talking to Dame. And they, but, you know, it was a vibe. But at the end of the day, they both got to sit there and concentrate because Big is like, all right, I know that motherfucker over there cooking. And he said the <laughs> same thing. I know that motherfucker over there cooking some shit. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that's just what the vibe was. And they went in there with just going, you know, went in there, went bar for bar, man. Yeah. I mean, um, they both came so hard on there. Yeah. And they respected each other, too. They was cool. You know what I'm saying? They had history, too. So, you know what I mean? Like, Big respected him. He respected B.I., both from Brooklyn. But, you know, that's I think that's what any artist at them times, you know? Any no artist going to be sitting there. They didn't need to write with each other. They both so dope. You know what I mean? But they both know, let me get away from him. Let me get my mind right. I can't let him distract me, be over here cracking jokes and fucking with me. Because that's all we used to do in there. Everybody crack jokes and fuck with each other. I think they both set in their corners so they can really get focused because they both respected each other as, as, as lyricists. And they wanted to make mm -hmm. sure, nigga, I'm going to come off. And I'm sure Ho was like, yeah, I got to come off on this nigga. And look what happened. One of, the, one of the dopest fucking records ever. Yo, did Big ever tell you he felt like Jay was nicer than him? Yeah. Hell yeah. He said that shit before. So he actually said that? Yeah. See, that's so, that's why you got to love him. Because Big is is so dangerous on that microphone, but he still give it up. I look down like he, yo, let me tell you something. Love Ho. Ho family. At that time, I was like, what? You think he... Because he said that line in a Dead Presidents, take a freeze off my kneecap. Nigga, believe that. You know, I wasn't catching lines like that because I was young, but it was just lines where B.I.C. was like, yo, my nigga. I think he got me with that line. I said, like, nigga, you want to hear... Some, want me to say some of your lines? Because <laughs> he, he ain't got... Nah, he don't got you, my nigga. But that's just how... Big was just humble like that. He was just a humble, mm -hmm. just cool... You know, he was just cool like that, but... Yeah, that's how he felt. I said that one time, and people was like, yeah, you bugging. I'm like, I'm just telling you what the man said, bro. <laughs> it don't take nothing away from him. It don't take nothing away from Jay. You know what I mean? Big is my number one. That's Jay number one artist. Yo, know, you Hov will tell you that. Yeah. I don't think it was back in them days, artists didn't say they was the best. If you knew somebody that was nice, and especially he was your man, you would normally probably would say that. You know what I'm saying? Because after Big died, what Hov said, man, I'm bigging up my brother. That's my favorite artist. You know what I'm saying? And Big thought it was other people that was like, nah, nigga, that nigga can hang with me. Nah, I get busy, but that nigga get busy too. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Big was just, he, he was just all about respect and shit like that. You know what I mean? Of course, he he, he never felt like, he, Big felt like he was number one. But it's times where he felt like, nah, he, he got me on that joint. That joint right there is fire. You know what I'm saying? And Hope would say the same thing. He'd hear some shit and be like, I got to get away from you, my nigga. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, nah, dog, you got, you're about to make me go home, man. And, and, and fold my whole album up. You know what I'm saying? Because they was, that's how much they respected each other, my nigga. You know, like they, they was real buddies too, real friends. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, both of them are so gifted, man. No doubt. You, you know, they really got, they got a God-given gift. No doubt. Um, so first single off the second album, Hypnotize. During that time, is it true that Big was mad at you? He was upset with you for something like... You left some pictures of him and some other mm -hmm. girls yeah. in a bag, and then Charlie Baltimore found out, and everything just erupted from there. How real is that story? <laughs> Super real. I told him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we was a uh, the hotel we was in. I think we was at the yeah, we was at the Four Seasons at this one because we went to like four different hotels. We was at the Four Seasons, and he kept telling me I had my own room, of course, but I would always be in his room. He kept telling me to take this bag out the room for like two, three days. Yo, Charlie about to come in. Get that bag out of here. You know, stalling. All right, when I go downstairs, take it. You know, we go out, do shit. Bag still up there. Next day, same old shit. One day I was downstairs and I don't, uh, she must have got there. And I just remember D-Rock banging on my door like, yo, come on, I need you to come upstairs, help me pack his shit. 
I'm like, pack his shit for what? He's like, yo, we got to get out of here, dog. Shit went down upstairs. I'm like, what? He's like, yo, Charlie went in that bag. Her and Big got into it. She threw the nigga ring over the window. She was throwing juices at him. I come in the room as wild fucking cranberry juice, all type of shit on the walls. Damn. I'm like, he like, yo, your man had to rush out of here. I had to get him up out of here, though. He, he out here, no shoes on, no nothing, shirtless. I'm like, oh, God. What the fuck did I do? I'm like, all right, pack his shit up. Go to the hotel with him now. He's sitting up there barefoot, no shirt on. <laughs> like, look, nigga, didn't I tell you to take that bag out? B.I., I know you told me that. I was like, yo, but why she went in my bag? He like, that ain't got, that ain't the point. She wouldn't have went in your bag if the bag wasn't in there. I told you for days to take that bag out of there, bro. He was like, yo, man, I'm sending you home. Fuck that. You got to go home for a little while. He was like, yo, get it, man. Give me my weed, too. Because, <laughs> <laughs> of course, I rolled all the weed. I got the bud. I'm like, uh. So I go downstairs. I got a room in there still. The new hotel. So Rock come with me. You know, he's like, yo, don't worry about it, little bro. You know you just mad right now. He ain't gonna send me home. So he didn't send me home. So for like two days, he would roll up his own bud, sit in his own room. Or whenever we had to go somewhere, he just wouldn't say nothing to me. We gotta go somewhere. I'm in the car with him. He just won't say shit to me. He'd hop out all quick and go sit over there. And um that lasted for about yeah, two or three days. Hypnotized video come up. Him and Puff do that whole car ride. Yep. You know, they're getting chased. That shit was for like two hours. So they went on a, you know, they taped that shit for like two hours straight. So we all just sat on set waiting for them to come back. When he came back, his shirt was wide open. He's walking with the cane. We like, oh shit. So he comes up to me, digs in his pocket. Love you, little nigga. Roll up. <laughs> like, oh, finally. You're not mad no more. But I, we always, we always bugging because we're like, yo. Why this nigga came back from that trip so happy? So we all like, yo, Puff, what you gave that nigga? You gave that nigga a pill or something? Why he, he come back, shirt wide open, he walking on his joint, he, he friends with it. Here, roll up, man. Roll up, little bro. I love you, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then it was right back to, we was right back to regular program from there. Yo, I mean, well, that's I had a to learn my story. lesson from that, you know, but I was wrong. Because I was like, mm -hmm. when I went to the room, I'm like, yo, why is she in my bag? He said, the bag shouldn't have been there. You're right. Especially when you told me to take the bag out three days ago, that was totally my fault. He lost ten. He lost a, a, a ten thousand dollar ring that Faith bought him from that. She threw it over the balcony, so I had to go look for that shit too down there. Didn't Did you find, find it? it? Hell no, I didn't find that shit. Oh man. man! So I was just like that was like real hectic, and he liked it that Four season hotel, so he wanted to have to leave out of that hotel too. So that's how we was leaving all these different hotels. Shit was just going down. We had to. Everybody, I guess everybody was thinking we was leaving these hotels because. Of we was in LA and people was trying to track us down. Nah, I wasn't that type of shit. We were just like leaving hotels because situations was happening. We was making. What was the vibe happen. like being out there for you? It was cool, man. It was cool. It wasn't, it, you know, it wasn't as bad as what people think it was. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it was love. Like, you know, Big loved LA. A lot of people don't know that. I mean, I mean, they shouldn't know. He made a song about it. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying he breaking LA down like he was from there. You know what I mean? Like, he loved just that environment, man. The clubs. He loved the palm trees. He loved the bud. He loved being there. Of course, we would have little situations here and there with somebody, not nothing crazy. So, you know, we'd be in the mall. Somebody might yell, West Side. We, you know, we walking down the strip somewhere. Somebody might bypass and, you know, Tupac, yell some stuff. But it wasn't nothing where we felt like we had to be, you know, we was in danger. Or we had to be on point. And we was like going out too. Like, you know, we was going to Billboard Live. You know, we was going to Bar 85. We was going to the clubs out there. People embracing us, showing love. It wasn't the whole city. They hated big. We had a situation with a certain group of people. That don't mean the whole coast don't don't love you or don't deal mm -hmm. with you. We didn't feel that way. At least Big didn't, because at the at the end of the day, we was all there with him. If he say go, we going. If he stay, we're staying. Big wanted to stay. I always tell people that, yo, why, everybody always go, why, why y'all was there so long, or why you didn't tell him to go home? He's the boss. <laughs> We're here because of him. And if he feel like it's no threat and he wants to be here, it's our job to stand down with him. You know what I'm saying? And if he want to stay, I'm staying. D-Rock is staying. You know what I mean? He, he wanted to be there. He, he, he loved LA. He loved the vibe. He, he just loved, he loved it out there. He loved to work out there. Like, he, he really enjoyed it out there. He wasn't thinking about leaving. We was there for two months before he passed out there. 
We was yeah, there a lot for of people don't months. know that. Yeah, we was there for like damn near two months. So on the night that he passed, you're in the car with him. Everybody's mm -hmm. at the vibe party in LA. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the party is jam-packed. Everybody start to leave. Walk us through those final moments, just being in that car. Like, like what was the vibe like? And obviously it turned into tragedy, but just can you walk us through that period? I mean, it was regular. It, 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 was, it, was, it was fast. Let me just say it that way. You, you know, you're in the club, you're having fun. They playing hypnotized like crazy. Love, love. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, when they said they cleaned the club out, Sophia has it. Um, we just started to leave. Remember, Big was still, you know, he was still in the cane. So it's like, all right, everybody tapped each other. Yo, we out. Come on, y'all. Everybody gathered up. Walked out the building. Puff truck pulled up first. Him and his security, everybody got in his truck. When Big joint pulled up, we got in the truck. And um, when we got in, we just, I remember D-Rock grabbing Big Head. Yo, you back, boy. Because D-Rock was in the back. <laughs> you back, because that hypnotizer was ringing off in there. Who all was in the car? Um, Me, Rock, and uh, Big, and uh, our homeboy G that was driving us around out there. And we started dealing with him when we was out there. And um, yeah, so when we pulled out the joint, and nothing either. Like, we're not seeing nothing. It's nothing to make us, like, look at, you know, it was just regular shit. We've been hanging out out here for months, you know, not thinking nothing of it. We get out, Puff pull out first. We pull out behind him. He blow past the light. We stopped at the light. When we stopped at the light, I see some chicks, like, you know, on the, on the curve. Me, I'm yelling out the window, yo, yo, ma, what's up? Yo, what's good? Da, da, da. And before you know it, a car just rolled up, started popping in the car. Didn't say nothing, didn't yell nothing, just pop, 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 Everybody got down in the truck, so that shit stopped. You know, we all hopped out. Everybody door open but big door. You know, we all went and got, we all went and got on the back of the truck and just like, and then we all peeked, looked around, big door went open. We all ran back to big. He was slumped over the console. And by that time, Puff had, his truck had came back around. And we all just, you know, were just talking to him for a second. And then everybody was like, let's get in the car. And we just got in the car and just drove to the hospital. We ran lights. We was hopping curves. We were just trying to get him to the hospital as quick as possible at that time. Did you know in your heart, yo, he ain't make it? Nah. Because, you know, when I, last time I saw him, his eyes were still open. You know, he was just looking up. You know, just looking like, you know, like the shock face, like, oh, shit. But he didn't say nothing. When all that shit was happening, we ain't, you know, no yelling, no nothing. But when we got when we got to the hospital, and they was all, you know, it took about four or five people. You know, Big was a big guy to get them out the car. It was a, a wet stain on his pants. And, you know, mm -hmm. I guess that saying they say, you know, when people go, you, you, you pissing, you know, and you shit mm -hmm. on yourself type of thing. I'm still not thinking that, though, you know, just thinking, he all right. They take him in the hospital. I didn't go in there. I stayed outside. Crying. Why? Because I was just stressed, man. Crying, scared, nervous. You know what I'm saying? Like, a bunch of shit going through my head. So I sat out there, and everybody was pulling up there. I remember the brat pulling up there. She came, and she gave me a hug, talking to me. A lot of people came and pulled up there. And like maybe like about 20 minutes later, somebody called me in there. I forgot who it was. Told me to come inside. And I knew something wasn't right. When I came inside, I see Mark Pitts like on the floor, like he was asleep. And they was like, yo, he didn't make it. Damn. And everybody was just in there. We just all bust out crying. I'm saying like, what? The fuck you mean he didn't make it? And when you know, you're thinking, there ain't no headshot. Wasn't no shot like that. Like, you know, like he just got shot in the side. Like, what, what you mean he didn't make it? Yeah, man. Was, that's the worst day. Of, that's the, like, the craziest day of my life, dog. Yo, do you remember what y'all was talking about before them shots rang out? Ah, last thing I told you, D-Rock just grabbed him on the head and was like, yo, you back, boy. You back. That was it. Like, yeah. 
It wasn't even that much time. You know, that was just so we got in the car. We, we pulling up, rock like, yo, you back. Shook him on his head. He was just like with his neck back, like smiling, like. And two minutes later, that shit happened. We didn't get a chance to talk about nothing. Nothing. It was just like, so we pulled out at that light. The light was like right there, like not even a half a block. And that car just rolled up in there, man, nigga, and, ch and changed our life. Wow. Who called his mother? D-Rock. Because that was the next thing. After all the sobbing and crying, and you know, we all were sitting in there. Everybody was like, so who going to call Miss Wallace? Phone went to one hand, went to another hand, went to another hand, went to another hand, so he got the D-Rock hand. And D-Rock was like, I'll do it. And he called her and told her. We picked up from the airport the next morning. Damn. It was the illest, man. And we brought her back to the hotel. And she walked in big room. You know, his stuff was still in there. He had wild wallabies in there. He had a suit that was like, um, suit was on the bed. She came in there. She was calling his name. Christopher? Christopher? That shit broke me down. I wanted to just walk into the hotel window and I punched it. A whole hand went through the window. And I almost wanted to kill it myself. Because that shit was right next to my artery right there. And it cut right here. And I took my hand. I was a big ass glass still stuck in my arm. His moms came over there, took it out, and was like, come on, let's go back to the hospital. I went back to the same hospital we were just in for hours, got stitched up. But that was the shit that, that broke me down. She came in there and was just seeing his clothes there. I'm just like, my son here. He's here. That shit was crazy, bro. Yo, again, Gene Deal, he said that you told him at the hospital a Muslim shot big. Little C's at the hospital. He said a Muslim shot big. And I said to Paul, with the blue suit, white shirt, blue bow tie? He said, Gene, how you know? I said, that motherfucker walked up to Puff car first. Is that a real statement? I mean, I said that because that's the glance of what I saw. I saw a bow tie. And mm -hmm. it was a lot of Muslims and some type of people there doing security as far as, as regular police too. That was the only glance I caught. I, I could just tell that person was suited from what I saw. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I didn't see much of it. You know, nobody don't look at nobody shooting somebody. The car came up, and it, it's no time to look and, hey, who that? Nah, but just from a glance, I saw a bow tie. And that's what I explained, that that's what I saw. What side of the car were you on? Was you on the passenger side right in the back? It. I was right behind You was right behind him. Mm -hmm. And your window was down? Yeah, because I, I was just sitting there hollering at some females and shit, so hollering at some chicks that was on the curve while we were stuck at the light. That's the reason why I got a chance to get that that glimpse of it because I was still out, and the, but mm -hmm. it it was it happened that fast though. It was like a car roll up and that shit just started firing in our truck. Hmm. Yeah. One theory is that a, a guy named Amir Muhammad was the shooter. I'm sure you heard that name. Mm -hmm. um, it's been movies that have been put out since documentaries. Um, and then there's another theory that a guy from the West Coast. Um, Named Poochie mm -hmm. might have been the shooter. Yeah. Do you have any theories yourself? Nah. Have, nah. nah? Uh, from from that one to the mere one to the Poochie one, it's like when you start to believe in one, another one comes. Mm -hmm. Start to believe in that, then another plot twist comes to, you know, it's been 25 years, man. I kind of just, I gave up on it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I gave up on it, man. You know, I'm just like, I don't think that we're going to ever get justice for what happened to Big. And who knows? Maybe it's a, maybe it's some street justice that got done without there. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But I don't know what story to believe no more. You know what I'm saying? I'm just like, yo, at this point, I'm just like, man, I'm over it. You know what I mean? Because I'm still, I'm still in tune with his family. They tired of his daughter hate hearing these type of stories. CJ mm -hmm. hate hearing these type of stories. His moms hate hearing these type of stories. But his moms want justice to this day. So when it comes to things like that, I would always step up for her, but you know, as yeah, for me, only son. Yeah, as for me, I'm tired of reliving it. You know what I mean? I, you know, 
You think I like telling this story all over again about what happened? You know what I mean? Like, you know, I don't like reliving that shit. As you get older, it don't get no better. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you know, it gets harder more to tell it because I understand more about life. And I'm like, damn, you know, my boy really got jerked out of his life because he was really trying to avoid all the shit that caught up to him. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, just trying to be peaceful, trying to bring peace, trying to chill out, trying to look out for people and look what happened to him. And it's just like, I think they spent us on purpose because on purpose because they didn't want to solve this case. And I think the same thing with Tupac too. I just think that they felt like these two rappers glorified that that lifestyle. You know, they should have known it was coming. Look what Tupac was rapping about. Look what Biggie was rapping about. Look what they was actually doing. You know, you live by the gun, you die by the gun type of thing. I just think they didn't really give a fuck. Yeah, I, but no, one let me thing tell you they didn't. But I bet you, in this day and age now, that would have happened. You would have found out what happened. If we're talking about now in these days, you would have found Tupac and Biggie Killer right away. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, you know, it. it you know, a lot of people that didn't want to talk before started talking now. So that's why the story is it's hard to believe. It's like, oh, this person was there. Now he's speaking up to 15 years. Should I believe that? Or maybe he's in... I don't know. It's just like, you know what? My choice I made was to... I'm over it, man. His family called me for something like that and they need me for. I'm going to stand tall for them. But, you know, I kind of just... I lost my faith in it. You know what I'm saying? Speaking of standing tall, man, um, Brooklyn really showed up because when Big's body was flown back in the funeral... That was, I mean, did that even, for you, I know that that was a rough, rough time, but to yeah. see the way Brooklyn showed out and just really stood tall for for B.I. during that funeral, did it touch your heart in a Hell different yeah. kind of way? Hell yeah. It took a lot of pain away that day. Mm. You know, we went from sitting there crying over a casket to coming in and seeing just people, man. Like, just, I mean, even on down from when we left the, the funeral parlor. You know, the funeral parlor was all the way damn near Harlem, 79th Street. You know, the city blocked the whole, shut down the whole FDR to take us a straight path to Brooklyn. And then we get there. I mean, it's kind of starting from downtown. You don't see a lot of that. It was kind of starting from downtown. When we got to my block, I'm talking about, man, people on top of cars. It's cars that's parked. All fuckers on top of the cars. On their fire escapes, top of the roofs, hanging outside their window. I was like, yo, what the fuck? That just gave you a whole different kind of energy. You know, even for his mom. You know, she was like, yo, when I saw that, and then right before we got to the corner, somebody threw on that hypnotized song, my dude, and, and, and they lost it. But that's what he wanted. He said, I rely on best style to shut it down if I die. Mm-hmm. He spoke that shit. You know what I'm saying? And uh yeah, that definitely gave us, you know, gave us some comfort, man, you know, to see like, damn, you know, they really love B.I. like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you don't really feel that love and see that love when you're actually going through things and when you're actually living through it. Of course, you see it when you do shows and you go around, but I'm talking about, that was a different kind of love. You know what I'm saying? Like, to see them really like, you know, they let the kids out of school for a half a day so they could come in there and pay their respects. And my little nephew and them, I, I watched some of the footage now, I'm like, oh, shit, that's my little nephew. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Love. Like, you know, like... People was actually out there, man, and just to see them people in tears and, and, and crying and risking their freedom to get locked up and, you know, like, they, they show their love for B.I. So, you know, that definitely was very comforting, like, you know, for the family, for us. We needed that. Yeah, man. Um, and it's crazy because a couple of years later, in 1999, you released your first solo debut album, mm -hmm. The Wonderful World to see Cesar Leo. And your boy's not here to see it. You know, he's not there to be part of it. Um, Jay-Z showed up on that album on a song called For My Niggas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did that song come together? I mean, you know, from the day B.I. passed, Hope was like, yo, listen, man, we family. It's because he ain't here don't mean nothing. You know, Hope was still like tight with us. You know what I mean? Like, nah, y'all my family. And I was like, y'all want to get you on this joint. And he was like, all right, let me know when you're ready. He came to daddy's house and recorded that joint with me. And when we did it, he he thought of the idea of the hook too. He's like, nah, you should do the hook like this. Mm. And I was like, well, he loved the record so much. So he was like, yo, nah, this joint right here is sick, dog. Sick. And that's how it came about. He was like, yo, nah, man, you you little bruh. Whatever you need, I got you. 
like no brainer type of shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, all, all the artists came through like that for me. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Red Man was on that album. Uh, Total was on that album. One Twelve was on that album. Mace was on that album. Buster Rhymes was on that album. Puff was on that album. G Depp was on that album. Shit, man. You know they. Um, they Kim obviously. Kim she was, was on, on the that single. Album. Yeah. Kelly Price. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, people really came. You know, people really came through for me. You know what I mean? And that's something. I wanted to fulfill, you know. I, I didn't. He didn't get a chance to do the album he wanted to do for me, but he was okay. There so for I got that. a question then. Why was Big not on it? Why was it no Biggie versus? Was there nothing left in the stash? Nothing that you just had set to the side? Um, it was just a lot of stuff with the politics. I think at that time, you know, with you know, every record, you know, they they didn't know what they was doing. If they were using stuff for the other albums that was coming out, or. I don't know. I don't. I, I. I totally forgot what happened. But I mean, of course, I used some intros and outros, of, of course, of it though. But um, it was just a lot of politics at that time to 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 get Biggie music, and uh, it was hard to get stuff. You know, back in them time, we still talking about '99, so it's hard to find reels, and you know, Bad Boy wasn't trying to give up too much stuff because they working on another project. So I kind of just like it's cool, you know. Mm -hmm. That was my test right there to see what I could really do. You know, what I mean, I felt like he was there with me on that album because. All the times I wouldn't write songs around him, everything he taught me about how to write, I actually utilized in working on my album. You know, all the stuff I was scared to do around him, I started to do on my album. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about saying the dopest shit, just about the way you say it. You know what I mean? And I started to like, all right, let me use everything he used to taught me. I ain't got to sound like him. It's going to be dope though, but it's all about how I say it. Get a flow, get a melody. And... I started to, you know, everything that he was he was teaching me then, I actually was putting into that album. And I had a team around me too that was helping me too. You know what I mean? My man Trey from Junior Mafia was there. Uh, you know, RIP to my brother Bristow. He just passed away from cancer. That's the oh. first time I started dealing with him when I did he because you know he's on like six songs on that album. Yeah. That's when he just came around. Bang had brought him to the house and he never left the house from there. He became a fish member of Junior Mafia right then and there. So I had a lot of help too. Kim. Kim was helping me jot down. Kim was writing rhymes for me after Big Pass. Like, you know, when I had to do features and stuff like that, Kim would jot verses down for me. You know what I'm saying? And um, she was helping me with the project. So I had, you know, whenever I was getting caught up or getting stuck because I was just starting to write, I had a lot of support. You know what I'm saying? A lot of support that was around me. And producers-wise, too. You know, D-Dot. He was there to help me with production. Mario Wine and, you know, Nosh. You know what I'm saying? And, of course, Puff was holding me down, too, overseeing the project for me. You know, he verified everything. Oh no, Carl Thomas was on the album too. I had Carl Thomas singing some of the. You had everybody album. on that joint. Yeah, dog. You know, and um, you know, it 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 didn't get the proper due that it's supposed to have gotten in '99. But let me tell you something. I get more props about that album now than when it was out in '99. Like people yeah. like yo, dog, you probably a classic. I'm like, really? He was like, yo, dog, that album's classic, dog. That's one of the best albums, one of the best slept on albums in hip hop. So it's good to hear that, you know. I'm, I'm I'm cool with that, but you know, I put out one good project, man. You know, I'm happy with that. Yeah, I mean, um, like I said, you you are definitely part of the golden era of hip hop, right in the middle of it, and you know, to be able to put out that classic album of your own, you know, that's just a Terry on top. Yeah, I'm working on part two too. Uh, oh, are you working on it now? Yeah, Jedi Kiss is helping me executive produce um, Wonderful World of Caesar Leo too. I'm just trying to get the right, you know, the right people involved, get the right people right, because I wanted to be like a, a spinoff of that. I wanted to be the same kind of sound. That album was fun. It mm -hmm. was radio, it was very, like dancey. I don't want to, I don't want to talk about everything I've been through. I still want to keep it fun and keep it cool. Uh, D Dot just sent me some tracks. I'm still in contact with Nasheem, so I really want to try to get some of the same people there, and also get some new people to add some new flavor to it. But you know, Kiss loved that album. He like, yo, man, we gotta do part two. And I was like, nigga, you gonna help me? <laughs> he was like, got you, my nigga. You know what I'm saying? You know, that's my brother. So, you know, I'm I'm excited to do that. I'm excited to work on another one. Yo, switch topics for a second. I was mm -hmm. talking to Vlad offline, and Vlad was like, yo, I got a chance to really hang out with C's yeah. um in like 04 down in Atlanta for a BMF party. Do you remember that? Did he? For real? I mean, I said, Yeah, he was like, yo, we got a chance to hang together. Um, it must have been you. Him, Big Meech, all of them was down there. Yeah. And he was like, yo, C's is my man. He's a good dude. And I'm like, yeah, C's always been a good dude. But no I was doubt. like, I didn't know y'all was hanging like that. Yeah, yeah. I know. I definitely remember meeting him a few times, but I didn't know it was for the BMF shit, though. Like, I used to be out there, like, 
every other week with them, you know, just hanging out at the clubs, recording music. I used to record a lot of stuff with um with Blue at that time, because Blue was rapping mm-hmm. and shit. So, you know, that's when they was really trying to do the music stuff. And I used to really just, you know, go out there, hang out with them, tear the strip clubs up, and we were going to the studio, record some records and shit. Meech was a good, mm. that was a good dude right there. Good dude. Still is a good dude. That's my partner, man. Yeah. Yeah, Good dude, sure. man. Yeah. Free, free, free the real, man. For real. You get a chance to watch that BMF TV series? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That shit lit. What you think about it? I like it, man. I like it. Because, you know, that's before, you know, it's giving you detail and, and just about their life just before what it was. It's dope. And I think watching his son play him, he looked exactly like Meech. Mm-hmm. I remember seeing that kid when he was when he was super little. You know what I mean? Like, so I just think it's really dope, man. You know, to see a story like that get turned around into something like that. You know what I mean? Like, you know, of course they was doing what they was doing. They they handled their biz like a man and their story came back around to bless them. I thought that was something that's like super, you know, super dope. Yo, in 09, the notorious movie was made. Mm-hmm. What'd you think about that movie? How accurate was it? And what'd you think about the actor who played you? I thought the movie was cool. You know, at that time, you know, of course, you know, certain things, you know, I think in every movie, some things you can expose and, and, mm-hmm. and say, you know, a movie's not going to be 100% accurate, you know. And when I, you know, being on that set, I realized how like, some movies just have feelings, you know, just to make the movie more, you know, that's probably not what really happened, but, you know, this didn't happen, but this did happen. You know, they did, they did feelings. So I would say like 60 of it was real. And, um, I liked it, you know what I mean? Because I, I felt like it gave a different standpoint of it. You know, we, went, we didn't want to focus it. His mom didn't want to be focused on all the drama, but everybody was used to reading about and hearing about for all the years. She wanted to show people what her son was really about, his personality, mm-hmm. his charisma, you know, how close he was with his mom, his family. You know what I'm saying? Like, she wanted to show who her son was. That was her movie. And, you know, I, I loved it because I, I thought that came across well about who Big was as a person. And the actor that played me, that's my that's my little brother to this day. Mark John Jeffries, that's my brother to this day. I felt like I was corrupting him because he's not a smoker. I had to teach him how to roll weed. <laughs> I had to teach him how to fuck with the shorties and shit like that. You know what I'm saying? But he was professional, super cool. You know, we had we had the weekends off. And every weekend, he would uh, get the Reebok Center in the city. And me, him, and his father, a bunch of his friends, my friends, we will go play basketball and just kick it. Super cool dude, super sharp, talented, and... um. I was happy to actually have an actor that was a, a actor. You know what I'm saying? Everybody else that was in there was kind of like their first time around. You know, uh, Gravy, um, yep. Anthony Smith, you know, the one that played Faith, Notori, yeah. like all of them was, I think, getting like their first or second go around. You know, little homie that played Mark, that played me, that had some movies, losing Isaiah. He was already doing some stuff. So I was like, you know what? I got legit. I'm legit. I'm cool. And then just being around him, he was just a super humble dude, man. That dude was still getting on the train. While he was playing that role, and still nah, do it to this dope. day, I was like, "That's why I love that kid, man. That's my little brother." Nah, that's dope, man. Um, in 2012, you and the Outlaws, you mentioned them earlier. Mm-hmm. Y'all squashed the beef, yeah. After years, mm-hmm. how did that happen? And um, also, how y'all, how did it come about? Because I know y'all made a record together. Yeah, yeah, we uh, we did the record for K Slade, but um, how we got together was a phone call happened. And I was talking to somebody and they kept saying my name. And Young Noble must have been around there. And he was hearing that. And he grabbed the phone. What up? It's Young Noble, Outlaws. I was like, what up? He's like, this C's? I'm like, yeah. He's like, Young Noble, Outlaws. <laughs> like, real aggressive. I was like, I heard you, my nigga. And he was like, yo, so what's up? I- Talking about a situation I had with a fatal before. And um, it started off aggressive. And then we wind up talking. And before you know it, we talked for two hours on the phone. Just, you know, airing shit out with each other. You know, because that was the first time I literally got a chance to actually speak to one another. And, you know, of course, it started off rocky. But then before you know it, we was talking. You know, and our conversation ended with the, yo, I'm going to talk to my people to see what they think. And I was like, I'm going to talk to my people to see what they think. I get on the phone with them. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, you know. What it's gonna be, bro? You know what I'm saying? Like, we're gonna see each other. We're gonna shoot this out, or we're gonna, you know what I mean? We, so we we on the phone for a minute. Like it was, he was bar, like we was barking on each other. Then you know, I guess we just got on some grown man shit and start sifting through shit. You know what I'm saying? And we talked for a hot minute. You know what I mean? It was like, I it, I, I I I felt the genuineness 
in his voice and he heard it in mine, you know what I mean? So we wound up talking, I called the homies like, yo, I just got off the phone with Lil C's. And ever since that day, me and him been talking, kicking it, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I was letting him know things that he didn't know about. He was letting me know things I didn't know about. He went back and his people was like, you know, so there's other people, they was like, yo, we cool with it. My people was cool with it. And then maybe like about four years later or something, so they called me and was like, yo, um, if I wanted you to do a song with the Outlaws, how would you feel about that? I was like, I'm cool with that. You know, actually, I've been talking to him. He was like, word? I was like, yeah, I've been talking to Young Noble and EDI. We've been talking about you the last five years. Though. We, we good money. He was like, yeah, because I want to do a joint man bridging y'all together. I said, you know what, Slate? If it's coming from you, I fucks with you. And if they with it, I'm with it. And they was down with it. And we did the song called Bury the Hatchet for one of the K Slate albums. Mm. And they came, to, they came to the city. They came to New York. And we shot the video in the middle of Times Square. And you know, them, them, my, them my brothers to this day. You know what I'm saying? I got to do a verse for, uh, they working on the project. I, oh, man, I put myself on the spot too. Because I ain't do, I got to tell my <laughs> man, Young Noble, I ain't do the verse yet. But I got to get to it though. Because they doing, they working on another uh, One Nation, I think, album. And um, they sent me a joint to get on. But you know, hopefully we're going to try to put this Outlaw Mafia, Mafia Outlaw project together, like a little six, seven song EP. I think, uh, I think the game need that. Because you see how far we came? I think the new generation need to see that. Because the new generation, they be ready to kill each other just off an yeah. Instagram tweet or Instagram post and stuff like that. It's like, if we can overcome this, y'all should be able to overcome y'all shit, man. We lost, we, we, we lost our head leaders to our crew. And we didn't like each other for a while because we was riders to our homeboys. But then once you start to realize you grow, you, you age in life and you wake up in life and you start to get married and you have kids and you got a family, you start to think life is, is, is more to life. Like, you know, me and Young Nobis be like, yo, man, it's crazy how me and you cool. At one point, we didn't even know each other and we didn't like each other. Mm. And I'm like, yo, dog, yeah. I'm like, yo, you're a cool motherfucker. I don't know how I didn't like you. But we didn't know each other to, to, to like or dislike each other. It's just that my man don't like you, so I don't like you. And vice versa. All right, man, my man don't like you, I don't like you. You know what I mean? And it's like, you know, it took us a while. It took, us a, it took about 10 years for us to finally sit down, but... It happened coincidentally, out of nowhere, spur of the moment, and that led to us to this day. You know what I mean? Like, we cool. Them my brothers, we check on each other, we hit each other up, and I think a project like that, uh, uh, I hope it'll help the new generation to see like, yo, dog, before you go out there and tell them niggas to pull up, or you go out there and want to put in some work with some shit that's just like some minor shit, think about what we're doing. Think about what other people are doing, man. It's just the, you know, you're making so much money and you got an opportunity to change people's lives, not just yours, but your family life, your friend's life. And you'll go out there and throw it away because somebody says something, said something to you about on a record about you. Like, come on, man. Like, nah, we can get over the shit we've been through. This younger generation should be able to get over the shit that they're going through. You know what I mean? Like, they're dying left and right right now. Yeah, you know what man. I mean, like, it's different, though. Yeah. And I hope it'll help. So I, I definitely, you know, that's something I definitely want to do. Well, speaking of burying the hatchet, you had a chance to bury the hatchet with your sister. Yeah. Not your blood sister, but I your sister I just like my blood sister, game. though. Yeah. No doubt. You and Lil' Kim, um, I thought it was it was real big of you. Um, you know, at, at, at this party for Biggs 47th, I think, um, yeah, you yep. grabbed the mic. It was a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. that night. We, we, we ain't do it for two years, and he'll be 50 uh, this year coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you... um. You know, you buried the hatchet. You did it publicly. And, you know, just how did it feel to finally put that behind you? Because y'all, y'all is, like you said, it might not be your blood sister, but that's your sister. I knew her before I knew Big. Uh. You know what I'm saying? I knew Kim before I knew Big. That's why the situation was so, that's why it lasted so long, because it was so personal. Mm -hmm. It's not about nothing with court shit, with none of that shit. We're not going to even address that, but it's nothing to do with that. My apology was I, you know, I wasn't a good brother to her. I made some wrong moves, some bad mistakes, and that was just the perfect time to do that. You know, I didn't plan that. We was all having a great time and, you know, and I just know the comfort she needed because I know her. And I mm -hmm. wanted to do that. I wanted to let her know that. You know, I wanted to let all the people around know that. You know what I'm saying? And I just felt like that's what I wanted to do and she deserved that. You know what I mean? Because a lot of times, you know, when Big died, she held me down. And I wasn't acknowledging that the way I was supposed to. 
And then we had other little situations that kind of separated us and other people that separated us. And we was too stubborn people just letting that shit egg us on. And, you know, and we just let God work. And God worked. And one day she, she hit me and we talked like nothing ever happened. And she had a plan that she wanted to do this dinner. She said she wanted to bring, she wanted to put Big Heart back together. And putting this heart back together was getting all his peoples together. And we all got together. You know what I mean? Me, her, the whole junior mafia. D Rock and you know, C Gutter. You know, he was, you know, he was locked up for 16 years. So he was home to he was home to be there for that. You know, Rube, just our whole team, Un, just, you know, like everybody that we started with was at that dinner. So I felt like that was the appropriate time to do it. And I needed to do that for her. And I wanted to do it for her. You know what I'm saying? I just felt like that was a great time. And you know, that's my sister for life. You know, just because we had a little falling out, the love was still there on both sides. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just that, you know, we were just, you know, people. You go through shit with your family when you don't speak to your brother for a year. You ain't, I ain't speaking to my brother for four years, you know what I'm saying? But the blood, that love, is still there. And, um, you know, I, I'm glad that happened, man. You know, that's my sister, and I love her to death. You know what I'm saying? And we, we back like we never left. Nah, so am I. I mean, um, it's clear that there's a lot of love in that crew, and especially between y'all two. So no I'm doubt. glad. Um, before I let you out of here, I got two last questions mm -hmm. for you. Number one, what's your greatest memory of Big? And number two, I mean, it's 25 years since Big passed. Mm -hmm. Why do you feel like even to this day, Big is still so loved? All right. Well, the first question is my, my, my favorite memory of Big, you said? Yeah. Um, I never really shared this one before, but uh, one time we was in Jersey and, uh, at the crib and I was in his room and shit. He was on the phone talking to somebody, laid down on his bed. And I was in the crib doing something. I forgot what I was doing. I don't know if I was in there dancing. I don't know if I was in there saying some dumb shit or something. And he was, whoever he was talking to, he was like, yo, this little nigga just got, this little nigga cracking me up right now. He just got me feeling like I got a little brother right now. And, uh, you know, as a kid then, that, that, that touched me, you know, because everybody used to fight for the attention from him or wanting to be there, you know. This when he just got his crib in Jersey. I have a room in there. I'm good money. You know what I mean? Like the way he just treated me, it wasn't like I was a little nigga. It's like I was a, I was a little nigga when I needed to be. When shit going down, I'm gonna hold my little little brother by his shirt. But then when it's time to get grown, I could grab the champagne, pop the champagne too, grab the mic and jump on that stage. You know what I mean? I'm grown enough too. I can grab the magnums and I'll go upstairs and I got four, five, 21 year olds up there lit. You know what I mean? Like, but that was the first time that where he he was just letting me know how. He embraced me like, you know, this is this is my son sometimes, this is my little brother sometimes, this is my homeboy sometimes, you know what I'm saying? Or it's my nephew sometimes. Like, you know, he was just like that one moment right there was where I was just like, all right, you know, that made me feel good. It, it, he, you know, it probably ain't meant nothing to him thinking about it at that time. He was just on the phone rambling with somebody, it was like, yeah, this little dude just got me feeling like I got like I got a little brother right now. <laughs> That's just getting on my nerves. Cause I was in there doing something crazy, but I never forget that. And that just made me. You know, it made me feel appreciated. It made me feel loved. Like, all right, he really, you know, he really fuck with me. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, why I think he's still here for 25 years? Because ain't nobody do it like that in 25 years. You know, I love a Drake. I love J. Cole. I love all, I, I love a lot of new artists. But it's nothing like B.I. It's nothing like that. He's still saying lines. He's still got lines you're still catching today. Trying to push 700s. They ain't made them yet. They ain't make a 700 yet. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, no. The man is like, it's rhymes that still sound like today. That could go up against any rapper bars today. That's just different kind of music. It's different kind of energy. And I think the blessing of him with the footage, you know, D-Rock having his footage, I think that also helped too. You see these documentaries. You get to just see him personality-wise. And you get to hear him talk and you get to hear his mind state and what he was thinking about, how he was doing shit. I think that just add on to it the way it's like, yo, because you get to see the transition, not just hear it, you get to see it. You know, you watch a documentary, you see him go from the fatigues with the BDK, Big Daddy Kane, Scarf and the thing to the Kooji, the Kango, <laughs> the Pinky. You know what I mean? Like you actually watch his life change and you watch what he did for us. You watch what he did for Un. Boy was 24 years old and got married. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just think it was, it's just, I think it's just everything about him all in one, but the music is just timeless music. 
You know, if you could turn this music on after 25 years, that's crazy. Like, you turn on Hypnotize, it still rocks the same way 25 years ago. Don't want story to tell. People gonna still like, it's just certain things that's just meant to be that way. I just think just music wise, if you wanna judge it on music, the music was just immaculate. It was just timeless. Who was making records like me and my bitch? Telling the story about you and your chick. Who's making the record about missing you? Talking about like, like he, you know, them type of songs and shit, storytelling and content, they're meant to last. They're meant to outlast mm -hmm. the average. You know what I'm saying? Because it's, it's something to it. It's something that you're going to live with. Like, yo, man, I went through that shit before. I could say I went through that at 44. A kid 24 could be going through something like that now. And like, yo, nah, that big song, man. I'm actually going through that right now. I'm only 24. You know what I mean? Like, nah, I wasn't even alive. I wasn't even born when he was talking about this shit. But that song resonated because my father played, or because my uncle played. You know what I'm saying? Or I hear it on the radio. Or you go on, you know, social media too. You know what I mean? They won't let it die. You know what I'm saying? Like, you go on social media, you see in big pictures, seeing big done over. Look at Halloween. You see all these Kim duos and big duos and Tupac duos. It's just like, I think social media just kind of brought their, their life back in here too. You know, especially with all the frivolous shit going on. It makes you look and go, Damn, boy, all this corny shit going on right now, I wish the Tupac and the Biggie was here right now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Because it's just so much corniness, so much fakeness that it made you just appreciate them more, especially what they was talking about. You know what I'm saying? You know, they was really just like putting down musically. Like, so I just think the music is just timeless shit that people are gonna never get over. I think as time goes on, it's, it's still gonna get better and better. Well, I'm gonna tell you something, C's. Um, you know, I appreciate you. I love the stories. No you know, doubt. thanks for really coming in here and sharing, man, and giving us so much insight into what it was like living through this amazing time in hip hop history. No doubt. So Sean I appreciate you, you, my you, brother. You was there for a lot of it, bro. So I came through for you, man. I appreciate you, man. Shout out to Black TV, man. Y'all doing great things on this site, man. And just keep it up and keep representing, bro. I appreciate you all the time, fam. One love, brother. One love, baby. You know what?